Why did the experience make you more fearful? I woke up that morning expecting I would live to the end of the day, and I almost didn't. In the middle of a sentence to my wife, I felt a pain in my abdomen. Within a couple of minutes, I couldn't stand up because I was bleeding so hard, and I was dying. It took an hour and a half to get to the ER. When I finally got there, the doctor estimated about 10 minutes before cardiac arrest. My body was going off a cliff when they were putting a large gauge needle into my jugular. As I lay there, this big black pit opened up underneath me, and I felt myself getting pulled into it. And I had no idea I was dying, but I didn't want to go into the pit. Because I knew if I went into the pit, I was never coming out. It was terrifying. I was like, F here we go. As that was happening, my dead father appeared above me in this sort of energy form. It's very hard to describe. It was like his essence was there. He was so welcoming me. He was like, it's okay, don't fight it. You can come with me, you're gonna be okay. I was horrified and I turned to the doctor who was working on my neck and I said, you gotta hurry, you're losing me right now. It destabilized me psychologically in a way that combat never even touched. Is that scary being on the brink of sanity? Sebastian, thank you so much for coming, man. I really appreciate you uh, for joining me this morning. My pleasure. Um, one of the things I actually wanted to talk about, I've been really interested in talking to you for a long time, and coincidentally it lined up with this very somber week in American history. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, just it's kind of out of left field, where, where were you on September 11, 2001? I was in... Um a very poor country in Eastern Europe called Moldova, uh, which is a little bit more in the news now because it's bordering the whole drama with Ukraine and Russia. Um, and I was doing a story on sex trafficking and a lot of the young women that are trafficked came, come out of that part of the world and Moldova specifically. And they're sort of renowned for their great wine and their beautiful women, basically. And that's what I was told by Moldovans. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so I was there in this sort of bro economically broken country, and um, and and people started coming up and coming up to me saying, "I'm so sorry for what happened." And I, I had no idea what they were talking about. And it was after the afternoon of September 11, which was morning in the U.S. and uh, and we rushed back to the hotel and um, turned on the news. And it was a French news channel, and it was showing the footage. And um, the planes and the burning and the towers coming down and people jumping or falling out of windows. And um, I, I, uh, I remember I saw that. I don't think that was shown in the U.S., but it was shown there. And I, I saw that and, I, and my body just rebelled like I started retching. I, mean, I sort of ran into the bathroom. I had a complete phys somatic, physical like reaction to that. <coughs> And um, what we learned, what we knew then, what we thought we knew was that it was a lot worse, that there were like 20 more planes in the air and American cities were burning and the economic system was collapsing. I mean, the, that obviously wasn't true, but that's what we were told. And um, I was like, damn, uh, I had like $100 in my pocket and a credit card. I was like, well, the credit card probably obviously isn't going to work anymore. And uh, I was like, I'm going to have to walk I was like, I'm going to have to walk home, like walk across Europe and get a boat back home. This is going to take a year. I mean, I really thought like, wow, this is obviously not what happened. But that, but for a while, um, and I, I was in a, uh, a really bad relationship uh, that I was sort of scared of ending. And I was like, surely this will do it. <laughs> surely, if it takes me a year to get home, it, it's over, right? Like... <laughs> You're already in a country with beautiful women. Yeah, that's right. Like, you yeah. know what? Like, how lame Honey, you... I'm sorry. I've got to stay here. I, 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 that's right. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Oh, wild. And when did you eventually make it back to America? Did you come to New York? Yeah, I was living in New York at the time. Oh, it took a week or so. Yeah. You know? and, and I was already sort of in mourning a little bit because, um, you know, Massoud had just been killed. And Massoud was the leader of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. And I had spent... Um, the sort of fabled guerrilla leader and who had fought the Soviets and a sort of tactical strategic genius. And he was holding the Taliban at bay, you know, outnumbered three or four to one, um, kind of cornered in northeastern Afghanistan. And, and, and I had gone in, you know, ar arguably a representative of a possi possibly democratic Afghanistan, right? And um, I had spent two months with him and his commanders in northern Afghanistan in 2000. And he was assassinated two days before 9-11 as part of the plot. 
right? Because what they, the Taliban didn't want is a is a military genius like Massoud with an ally like the United States coming at them after 9-11. So they got rid of Massoud. They finally managed to kill him. And two days later, 9-11 happened. And the Taliban didn't quite have time to roll up the Northern Alliance before America could get back in, could, could get in there with special forces and with the Air Force. They couldn't quite do it. So what we saw, because I went back there as fast, to Northern Afghanistan as fast as I could, and I hooked back up with the commanders that I'd known the year before. And um, so, you know, what I saw was the Northern Alliance liberating Kabul. I mean, the U.S. wasn't there, right? Mm -hmm. They had airplanes in the sky, but they weren't there in any numbers at all. But it was the Northern Alliance, an enormous cost to their fighters, that liberated Kabul um, and the rest of the country. Wow. Now, in a lot of your work, including freedom, you talk about crisis creating unity. Did you feel that unity when you got back to New York? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, New York is such an extraordinary city, so many different ways. <clears throat> um, but in, in those terrible days, particularly, and I, you know, I remember at one point there was a guy, you know, everyone was sort of shell-shocked. And, you know, it still smelled of, you know, burning building. And, you know, it was a, a horrific time in a lot of ways. And, and um, I remember there was a guy in a suit um, standing you know, with a briefcase, like a businessman or whatever, like this is like a week or two later, standing on a street corner just staring. And obviously his thoughts had sort of paralyzed him. I don't know what was happening with him. And I watched someone go up with, to him and touch his shoulder and say, hey, man, are you all right? You know, people were taking care of each other. Hmm. Um, and um, in, a very, in a very beautiful way. Like, it, you know, obviously you can't stay there forever, but but um, it was quite a, an experience. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't really remember anything about the events at all. I'm 26 and living in Florida at the time. I didn't yeah. know well, of what was going on. And so, but the thing that people always point out is that specifically in New York, there was a, a great sense of community and unity and people really coming together. Yeah. And when I was, you know, listening to excerpts from the book, like that really stuck out, like, wow in the worst times and the worst crisis, including war, either you know foreign or domestic, those moments are what people kind of bond over. And there's a beautiful silver lining to it yeah. that, you know, obviously the tragedy, you know, no one wants, but there are things, especially within our American society, that are so fragmented that are really interesting that people can hold on to. Yeah, there's a really interesting dynamic in human society, which for most of our history, meant groups of 30, 40, 50 people, 100, 150 people maybe, something like that. Um, sort of equivalent to a platoon or a company in the infantry. And um, so when there's no threat and when there's food and when everything's fine, it's adaptive to, for, the, for individuals, for people to pay attention to themselves, to, the, to their own goals, their own hopes, their own projects, right? That's very adaptive, meaning it's... it's, it's um, good for the species, it's good for people to focus on their, their own thing for a while when they can, right? They're very individualistic. But there's the, also this other response when there's a threat, when there's a, um, an enemy or a, a, some kind of dangerous stress going on. This other response is, is unity, where the individual sort of disappears into the group endeavor, which invariably is survival, right? And so what people do is they, they're constantly toggling back and forth between, okay, everything's good now. I'll focus on my thing. Oh, the enemy's coming or the river's rising or whatever it may be. Okay, I'm part of a group now. My individual interests and concerns don't matter. I'm prepared to risk my life, sacrifice my life for the group because without the group, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't survive. And for most of human history... The, both things were needed because the world is not a safe place and there's continually threats and hardships and stresses coming down the pike, right? Modern Western society, and in many ways this is an incredible blessing, but modern Western society has figured out how to eliminate most threats, most stresses, most hardships from our daily experience. So we're sort of, you know, we're sort of stuck in the individual orientation and we never get the, almost never get the chance to toggle back to this other profound and profoundly human experience, which is to be part of a group, a survival group, where you are, you're a necessary part and um, 
your individual your individuality doesn't ma- wa- matter for a little while. Mm-hmm. And um, if you're going back and forth between those two things, it's quite a healthy balance. It's a very human balance, and it makes it gives people profoundly meaningful lives. If you're stuck in just if you're just completely stuck in your self concern and your self interests, as profound as those might be, you're really missing out. And it makes it, it's actually psychologically, in terms of mental health, it's actually quite hard on people to be stuck like that. Yeah. I actually, I think it was a quote from Jordan Peterson, I believe, who said that the greatest way to be miserable is to constantly focus on yourself and your needs. Just to perpetually navel gaze and think about you, 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 you is a great way to be very unhappy. Yeah. I, 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 it's called um, uh, anxious rumination. Anxious rumination. Right. It's just sort of going in circles, worrying about the things that concern you. And and um, there's some data that women have higher rates of depression than men. And one of the theories for that is that they ruminate more and they're known to ruminate more. And rumination can lead to anxiety and depression. Hmm. And women are at higher levels of those things um, in this country and throughout the world, right? There's a theory that the, the anxiety and depression are the result of sexism in society, but the, the, the researchers haven't really found any difference between depression levels in women in, say, Saudi Arabia, which is extremely oppressive to women, uh, and, say, Norway, which is extremely enlightened and things are fairly egalitarian. It's like there's not much difference. So, so there's something more basic going on, and the theory is that it's rumination. And when you put people in a situation where they don't have the time, the freedom to ruminate, one of the strange things is that mental health improves, Right, so they they looked at the um, I looked at the the Blitz in London. So the Blitz, um, a terrible period of six months or so in England during World War II, when the German Air Force bombed English cities, you know, day and night, basically killing thirty thousand civilians. Right, so you you know buildings collapsed on people. You know, I mean, awful, awful things, and um, the worst kind of trauma. And the, 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 the civilian population sort of mobilized to deal with this. They were sleeping in the tube stations and digging people out of rubble and, you know, whatever you have to do to survive, the Londoners, people of England were doing it. And so what they found, what, the, the, the government was prepared for mass psychiatric casualties, right? I mean, these are civilians getting bombed every night, right? And what happened was admissions to psych wars went down. And as one official, surprised official put it, he said, we have the the chronic neurotics of peacetime driving ambulances. They're thinking about something other than themselves. Um, One English woman, um, I read an oral history of the Blitz, and this one English woman said, just a middle-aged woman in London said, we would have all gone down to the beaches of the Thames, the Thames River flowing through London. We would have all gone down to the beaches of the Thames with broken bottles to fight the Germans if we'd had to. and uh, and so so the 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 reality for 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 people is that when things are really bad, you're actually liberated from obsessive concerns about yourself because you will only survive if the group survives. There's no individual survival mm-hmm. for humans. Uh, we die almost immediately in the wilderness if we're by ourselves, and that that knowledge is very deeply wired into us. Right. Do you think there's any, historically or in present day, any type of pacification for this anxious rumination that isn't set in, you know, tragedy or war or famine or some type of major crisis? Like, I feel like sports in some capacity might supplement that uh, desire to be a part of something greater, sort of simulation of war type thing. Do you think there's any, uh, like, healthy ways that society could inject some type of collective action that would combat this rumination? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because, I mean, sports are great, right? And exhaustion's great. I mean, just on a neurochemical level, like the, 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 um, what happens in your body when you exercise and when you exhaust yourself is a, it's really good for your mental health. And among other things, there's less metabolic energy left over for your brain to ruminate with. So what they found, mm-hmm. what researchers have found is that as you, as you exercise more and more, you ruminate less and less because there's a finite amount of caloric energy in your body. And when your body uses it up, there's less left left over for the brain. Oh, that's so and, funny. And I can't remember the researcher's name, but he sort of like measured this effect. And there's a lot of, um, I mean, I have a friend who's an ultra marathon runner and a, and a journalist, and she's looked into this phenomenon. There's a lot of people with trauma running ultra marathons and they make them feel better, right? I mean, the, the, you're running 200 miles a week actually 
improves people's mental health. They're taking their brain for a walk. Yeah, yeah, and they're let's tire it out. (laughs) Yeah, just tire it out. And if you're sitting at home, you really can go around and around and around on the things that make you feel bad, right? And you know, I had a um, I had a situation a few years ago, which we can talk about. But I almost died. I had a sort of like freak medical accident. I had a undiagnosed aneurysm in my abdomen that ruptured. And it was a structural abnormality, right? It had nothing to do with my health. It just ruptured, and I basically bled out into my abdomen. And, you know, my chances of survival were, you know, probably 10% or something. And I and I managed to survive. And afterwards, I just kept ruminating about, like, how close it had been, how, what a close call it was. And finally, I mean, it got the, my, my fears about it got so intrusive that I finally talked to a therapist. I was like, I, this is incapacitating me. And she said, she was like, you have to stop thinking about how close it was. It, it's upsetting. Don't. Like, just stop thinking about it. You can't. Just stop yourself. And it worked, right? Like, it, 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 And you can dig yourself into a fearful, depressed hole if you if you let yourself. And the, the great advantage of a crisis is that you, you don't have the bandwidth to do that. And But to answer your question, so yes, exercise is great for all kinds of reasons. But in terms of a, like, societal endeavor that takes us away from our preoccupations and 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 allows us the um in some ways the good fortune to participate in something greater than ourselves um every once in a while there'll be a 9-11 or a pearl harbor that is enormously tragic and sort of forces us to do that and of course we can't wish you know would never wish for those things uh, they're terrible tragedies so how do you how do you reproduce that in people um, without the tragedy, I, you know, I, I think um, I think mandatory national service for young people would mean amazing thing. You know, I don't mean the draft, right? I mean that, that there should be ways, amazing ways, to serve this country, this incredible country, without carrying a rifle, and uh, the nation needs childcare for working mothers uh, and fathers, uh, school teachers. They, um, this, the, the country needs people on farms and in the in the urban you know poor urban areas. I mean, like we have this incredible resource of young people in this country, and national service would mix people up economically, racially, intellectually, um, in every possible way to I think break down some of the, the insane political divisions in this country right now. Um, but it would also give people a sense of uh, participating something in something greater than themselves. You know, I, I grew up during Vietnam. And, um, you know, when there was a draft and then they ended the draft that I was the first generation, I was born in 1962, I was the first generation to get a selective service card in the mail uh, after the draft was ended. And the selective service card basically said, in case we need to draft you in the future, we need to know where you live and how to reach you. Right. And I mean, y- young men still get these things. Apparently, right. Right. N- not, w- not young women, but young men. Right. And so the government just wants to know where are you? Wh- how can we reach you if we need you? Right. And, you know, I was raised in a liberal household in, in you know, outside of Boston during Vietnam. My parents were pacifists and all that good stuff. And uh, I showed this to my father and, you know, he grew who grew up in Europe. His dad was Jewish and he came here during the war while America was like saving the world from fascism. Right. So I showed but I showed this to my father and I was like. I knew he was against the Vietnam War, and I said, "I'm not signing this. That the government needs me to know where I am in case they need to draft me." And uh, he was like, "Oh, you're definitely signing this." Oh, really? You know, he was a huge pa- pacifist. He said, "Are you definitely signing this?" He said, "America saved the world from fascism." And there's the graves of thousands of young American men, just like yourself, in Europe. The, that was the price that was paid for 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 saving the world from fascism. And he said, "I hope not." Well, you know, he said, um, he said, you owe your country something. Like you have, being part of something as great as this country requires something of everyone, right? And you may, you don't know, you may owe your country your life. Hopefully not, but you may, and you don't know that at this point. Mm -hmm. So you're going to sign that card. And if it's an immoral war, like Vietnam was, in his opinion, Vietnam was an immoral war, if it's an immoral war, it's, it's your moral duty to protest it and go to prison if necessary protesting it. But if it's a moral war, if it's a war against fascism, against the oppression, suppression of human rights and human dignity, it's your duty to fight it. So sign that card. And when he put it like that, I was like, oh, yes. Like, 
I'm finally every every 18 year old boy wants to be part of something greater than themselves. I think, or most of them, anyway. Right? And I lived in a safe suburb of Boston. There was no way to be. There's no need to be part of something greater than myself because there were no threats, there were no hardships, there was nothing. Life was easy. We didn't even know our neighbors, right? And finally, here was this thing that was potentially heroic, right? I was like, and and I signed it. Of course, I was never drafted. We didn't have a you know, I grew up during a time of, of almost no military conflict for this country and in the 80s. And uh, um, so, but it really taught me something about you don't get all this for nothing. If you're part of a group, you have to put something into it. And one way to do that, I think, and this is finally, it's a long, it's a long answer to your question, but... Um, no long answers. This is perfect. <laughs> okay. The country actually does need some outside of wartime, does need some things from you, from all of us. Um, I survived because 10 people donated blood, and they put that blood in me. I'd lost two-thirds of my blood, right, when my aneurysm ruptured. Into your abdomen? Yeah. Wow. And, you know, if, they, if I'd been stabbed in the stomach, I would have been better off because the doctors would have known where to look, right? But when you just have an internal rupture, they have no idea where it is. And it's basically just spaghetti in there, right? Like, it's, I mean, <clears throat> and... Um, 10 people, I needed 10 units of blood. I'd lost two thirds of my blood. My blood pressure was 60 over 40, right? I was on, I was minutes from dead when they got me to the ER. <clears throat> Donate blood, right? Like you will be, you will be me one day. Like you will be in the ER needing blood in your veins to, to survive. And, um, and if it's not you, it will be someone else that you love who needs that. Donate blood. You can't make it. Humans cannot make blood. And it's the ultimate free lunch, as Christopher Hitchens always says, the ultimate free lunch. They take a pint out of you, and within a few days, you've reproduced that pint. And it's actually even quite good for you to do that once in a while. Um, so I donate as much blood as I can, like several times a year. Oh, wow. Did and, you do that before? Or was that just No, no, incident? it was because of my aneurysm. Because I saw the, the light bulb went off. Like, oh, my God, 10 people saved my life. Because of these 10 people who I'll never never know, my daughters will have a father. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old right now. They were, you know, this is three years ago that this happened. Um, and uh, and um, serve on jury duty. You have to serve on jury duty. Um, jury duty is one of the main things that keeps the society from being autocratic. It means that no one person can decide the fate of another. No one person, no no president, no sheriff, no governor, no corporate leader um, can decide what's going to happen to another person. Only a jury of peers can. And you have to serve. And if you are ever wrongfully or rightfully, but let's just say wrongfully accused of a serious crime, you're going to depend on 12 people showing up in the jury box to decide to understand that you're innocent. Because without them, you're going away, right? You have to serve jury duty. And it's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, and, um, and finally, vote. The country needs you to vote. If you don't vote, you really do lose all right to complain about the state of affairs in this country. Um, give blood, serve jury duty, and vote. And um, not only are you doing something very good for the country, you're doing something even better for yourself. You're giving yourself the exquisite experience of being part of something greater. Interesting. Now, what do you say to people that are listening to this saying, well, I pay my taxes. That's enough. I do enough, right? My, that's yeah. the only thing that's really required of me or else I go to jail. You don't have to pay your taxes. You can go to jail. You can. I mm -hmm. mean, I, you know, why would you? But you can. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, paying your ta people pay their taxes, I think, often resentfully. One of the great things about giving blood and voting and serving in, ju in jury duty is you can do it joyfully. I mean, you can do it thinking, wow, this is amazing. Like, I could, like, I'm part of this thing, right? I think it's harder to do that when you're writing out a check for $15,000 or whatever. You're, you, know, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's like, let's be real here about how humans are. Um, uh, it's just, it's a straight, when you write a check, it's a straight loss out of something that you would have other purposes for. But that's not true. There's no loss involved in giving blood or in voting or jury duty. Uh, bring a good book to jury duty. You're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Interesting. Now, when it comes to voting, I sometimes have a hard time because I personally feel extremely politically disenfranchised. I don't really trust any of the politicians, the last election uh, and the one before that. Basically, my entire adult life that I could vote, yeah. I've kind of looked at the candidates and said, this is all horseshit. And I don't like the I don't like the dichotomy that I'm put in. And as a result, I've sort of refrained. I don't, I don't like participating in this like trolley problem of like, oh, what is the better of two evils? Right. And I'm curious, what would be the, what would be a better mindset to approach that with, in in terms of like our current you know political situation? Well, you know, I would say first of all, the right of the ordinary citizen to vote is a new one. Uh, it, it was a product of the the Enlightenment in Europe. Um, it began with the top, basically the toppling of the supreme authority of, of, of royal families in the countries of Europe and in America. And a lot of people have died for the right to vote, even if it's a useless vote, right? Uh, but the right to do that is, a, um, is in some ways a kind of sacred, sacred one, very, cl very closely tied to human dignity, even if the political process is corrupt as hell, which I think it often is. Mm -hmm. So I'm not disputing what you're saying, but... Um, there is there's something very noble about going through that that process of voting, saying like I'm here, I'm I'm going to state um, uh, I, I'm going to I'm going I'm going to state my principles in the way in the way that I vote, uh, and also you can go to I'm reaching way back into introductory philosophy in college in 1980, but is it Kant's um, categorical categorical imperative? imperative? Yeah. Right, like, you, would you have nobody vote? Mm -hmm. Right. No, I would want you would want somebody someone to, to vote. Right, exactly. Like, would you have no one donate blood? Would you have no one serve on jury? No, of course not. So if you if you if you're asking for other people to do those things, you kind of have to do them yourself, mm -hmm. right? Or you're being hypocritical, and and uh, I think that's what Immanuel Kant would say. Do you think voting third party or for voting for sort of like a fringe candidate that has no chance of winning is a wasted vote? I mean, I, you know, I would vote my ideals, right? If the fringe candidate um, exactly reproduces your your sort of worldview, your, your, your thinking on how to run a moral and decent society, then vote for them, right? Um, but I wouldn't, you know, if you just do it out of a sort of protest vote, you're 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 at, you're you're opting out of participating in your own society. Mm -hmm. You're saying I'm not really part of this deal, but you are, right? I mean, you're living in a building, you're driving a car, you're using a, a cell phone, you know, whatever. You are part of this deal, right? You're completely enmeshed in it, and um, I think there's uh, you know, so I think you should vote, and I think if you're disappointed in the political process. Um, you should, we all should be really actively engaged in reforming, reforming it. And, you know, I think, um, I think there should be, you know, political leaders should not use their position for their personal gain, for their personal empowerment, right? On either side of the aisle and both do it. It's a huge amount of corruption in American politics. And, I keep waiting for the citizenry to sort of rise up and say, enough. You all are serving yourselves. You're not serving us. And, and, um, and I, I can't imagine that uprising happening without people voting. Right. It's just, it's the, it's the, it's the price of the ticket for participating in all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess it, allows just a base level awareness of what's happening within the society, right? Yeah. Like if you are going to vote, you're going to look into the policies at least yeah. a little bit. And then, then you'll realize, oh, these people are not actually yeah. even serving me. Yeah. So I guess the, the roots of the uprising can be predicated in, you know, going through that, that process. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And yeah. it makes you feel good. I mean, at least me. It's mm -hmm. like, wow, I walked down to the polling station and I dropped my bat, you know, like it's, I mean, you feel like you're part of something. Like, so if only, if only... I mean, one perfectly good reason to vote is to do it for yourself because it makes you feel good. You walk home feeling good. I sometimes, I don't know, I've I've voted in smaller elections at, and I've walked away kind of just feeling like a, like a like a chump in a way where I felt like I was participating in the charade. I felt like I was I was actively perpetuating this thing that I was like, I don't think this vote does anything. Well, I'll tell you what, the people that are running the charade, what their real preference is that you not vote at all. 
Mm-hmm. So you are doing what they want you to do. Right. By not. By not. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm with you on blood donation, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Donate blood, jury duty, vote. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are good. And then mandatory military service, I think, would be another uh, one. Uh, national service. Or mandatory. national service. Yeah, with the military option, right? And I guess an example of this yeah. would be like Korea or Israel, I guess, is another example that would have some type of nationalized service. Well, I mean, they have mandatory military service, right, which I don't think is a moral thing uh, for this country to do. But but mandatory national service, where you serve the country in some fashion for a year, mm-hmm. I think is tremendously healthy and good. And uh if you, and, and with a military option, so some people are, are just going to want to join the Marines and not teach school children, you know, whatever. It's all good. Like, but, but, um, I think it, um, I, I think that it would make us feel like a country. And the problem right now is we don't feel like a country. Yeah, that's interesting. I know I have friends that have served in, again, this is slightly different, but served in military service mandatory through Israel and Korea. Right. And all of them have, sort of said, you know, none of them saw combat. All of them were yeah. sort of working within like sort of clerical positions. And all of them have said, you know, the role really ignited their passion for their country, that their passion for the other people that they were, they live with, that yeah. they, you know, served. And especially in America where it is so sort of culturally fragmented, you yeah. know, like some like Korea is, you know, ethnically, spiritually, you know, socially homogenous all the way through basically. Right. And the United States is not. Yeah. And the idea of having some type of required work. Yeah, what would that look like, you think, a, a nationalized service? Like, what would be the, a job that someone could have? If, you know, if there was a nationalized service, I turned 18, what would I do? Uh, I mean, it's an endless list. I mean, in the 30s, they had young people repairing hiking trails in wilderness areas, hmm. right? the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, they were building dams. They were building bridges. They were building all kinds of things. I, You know, I think one of the... Um, I mean, the math, it's sort of math does not work for a single parent, say a single mom in New York City, uh, to work one or two jobs and have young children. The math doesn't work. You can't do it, right? The child care costs more than you make it, you make it a lot of jobs. And um, so, you know, one of the, you know, one of the incredibly helpful things, um, I think, would be a national um, and uh, you know, a push for some kind of national childcare, you know, mm. that's that's free, right? And it's part of the job of young people is to take care of children for a year, for some, for some young people, right? I mean, amazing experience for them. Anyone with younger younger siblings will know that it's like a, you know, difficult but very rich relationship. And it would it'll allow parents and single parents. To, to have jobs. I mean, w- how would you organize and institute this? I don't know. It would be It's a bureaucratic nightmare, right? But, I mean, look, if you want to do it, you can get it done. Like, we landed on the moon. We can do it. Right. And, and uh, um, so, this, and then, then after a year, it's over with. And then you move on to your life, and someone else takes your place. Interesting. Yeah, I like that idea. I always envied the Mormons. This is not the exact same thing, but the yeah. idea of doing a mission, I always thought was so cool. And obviously this is foreign, this is not domestic, but the right. idea of turning 18 and saying, hey, you're going to go spend two years yeah. in a different country, learning a different language, immersing yourselves among different people, and then coming back home. Yeah. I just think it's such a powerful and important thing, specifically for young men to do. Yeah. And this kind of resembles that in a much more feasible way because it's all domestic. Right. Yeah, right. I, I like that idea. And I, I mean, even more so, this to me, I'm curious what your thoughts are with this. In America, it feels like there's no coming of age ceremony for men, right? Like most or, or, of- all, Or women, yeah. Yeah, or women, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah, or women. But I guess for men, historically, there's always been these traditional sort of regiments or traditional rituals or ceremonies where men are now men, officially. You know, obviously right. in Judaism, there's a bar mitzvah and, you know, all these other religions, there's this, this thing. Right. And within the U.S., culturally, there is nothing. And I wonder if that contributes to sort of like a perpetual adolescence where yeah. men don't necessarily feel uh, like they've they've received a blessing to grow up or something. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are yeah. with that. So the anthropologist, the great anthropologist, Margaret Mead, said something like uh, the definition of womanhood is biological. Like you start menstruating, you have the capacity to become pregnant, you are now a woman, right? Um 
and those those consequences once um, once initiated are unstoppable. Right, you're pregnant. You're going to be given birth, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how dangerous it is. This is happening, right? Um, she said, but the definition of manhood is social. You have to prove that you're now a man. It's a social construction. It's a social definition. And the way you do that is to demonstrate that you are willing to put the needs of the group ahead, ahead of your own. You're prepared to be self-sacrificing. When, so when, when before Western medicine, the mortality rate for uh, pregnancy was 1% per birth, right? Yeah, that's, that's so pretty if, high. Yeah, so if you have four or five children, you have a five, four or 5% chance of dying, which is probably roughly analogous to sort of battlefield deaths for young men, right? And um, Wow. So those women, in some sense, you know, the human race would end without babies, right? So in some sense, those young women who are giving birth are putting the, 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 the future of their group, uh, even of the human race, uh, in, you know, ahead of their own personal interests, which, of course, should involve avoiding that kind of danger at all costs, right? And so what's the equivalent for men? And for most of human history, men, precisely because they don't get pregnant, um, and therefore are not particularly valuable in reproductive terms. Um, we're engaged in the things that were really dangerous that can get them killed, like hunting large animals and warfare, defending the community against predatory sort of rival, rival groups. And um, so to find out if a young man is prepared to risk his life defending his people, right, defending the group of young men that he's fighting with or hunting with. Um, you don't want to find out that this guy's a coward in the middle of the battle, right? You want to know if this guy's standing next to you in the middle of a battle, like, that you can count on him and he's prepared to run some risks to save your life and vice versa. You don't, you want to know that all before the battle starts. And so the way you do that is initiation rights. So where the, the young men have to prove, I will go through this. I'll go through anything to demonstrate my valor, my ability to withstand pain, uh, to um, to um, subordinate my fears, right? And um, uh, young women aren't asked to prove those things because once they're pregnant, and in a, in a society without birth control, young women get pregnant very, very quickly, right? With Once they're pregnant, um, no one else's life is depending on their courage. You're pregnant. It's not going to, you know, you know, what, what happens to you is not going to affect whether I survive. It's all about whether you survive, right? So, but with with young men, there's this sort of like co compact, this sort of collective agreement. We will all risk our lives for each other. And um, that's where these brutal male initiation rights come from, which are effectively a sort of form of torture. And... Um, and and then you're part of the group, and you can see that in tr in tribal societies all over all around the world, North America, Australia, Africa, everywhere, right? So, um, in this society, those th threats are. I mean, women still die in childbirth, right? I mean, uh, uh, childbirth is the, if I'm remembering correctly, the number one killer of young women in the world today. It's still the threat, right? But there is no equivalent threat for young men. And so they don't have to prove that they're worthy, that they're courageous, that they're um, willing to give themselves for the group. And that means, as you say, there's a kind of perpetual adolescence. And I think it's um, extremely destructive to young men. I think they want to feel worthy and honorable and courageous and um, part of something greater than themselves. And there just simply isn't the opportunity in the society because there isn't the need for it. And I think that's extremely hard on young women and young men in a way that you're, there's no equivalent for young women. Hmm. Yeah, we've removed all the violence from society. We've, we've made everything very comfortable and survivable. We've, it, society has improved, it, you yeah. know, almost undoubtedly in the last 200 years. But one of the negative side effects of that is that, you know, men are not going to be able to prove themselves. And I wonder if that leads into almost like this crisis of masculinity uh, I don't know if men really even understand what masculinity is now. I, you know, I have a, um, uh, I know a young man who, who um, 
we were I was with his aunt, right? And we were talking about manhood. And this guy was in his twenties. Um smart, strong young guy, right? And 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 I asked him, I was curious. I said, What do you what's your definition of to be a man, like manhood? And um he glanced at his aunt in panic, in alarm, and said, is it okay to talk about this? As if it was sort of a verboten topic. Like it's, it was somehow not even polite <laughs> to acknowledge the idea of manhood, right? And of course there's an idea of manhood, right? As there is an idea of womanhood. I mean, it's like, how, we're, we're mammals, right? Like we're, we're, we're humans. Like how, how could that be absent from our conversations? And... Um, it's really interesting if you ask women what the definition of manhood is, they'll, they'll give you some pretty, like, pretty honest answers. Like, you know, that's someone who will stand in front of me if, if there's, if, if there's in, in the face of danger, right? Like, I mean, if you're standing behind me, if the attack dog comes bounding out of the yard, like the, the, the Doberman comes bounding out of the yard. Uh, jump the and, fence and, and, and run away. And, and, and you get behind me, you're not a man. Sorry. Like, you know, we go through, a, you know, I'm sort of like imagining what, what it feels like to be a woman. It's like we go through a lot of shit, right? We get pregnant, we, you know, et cetera. Like, I, you know, we have our periods. We have to put up with you guys. Yeah. Like, the at least, at the very least, the one thing you can do is get in front of us if there's something <laughs> dangerous coming, right? Yeah. Like, at the very, very least, right? And um, so I, uh, I asked this one woman who was an anthropologist— sort of what um, what her definition of a man was. She's a middle-aged lady, very, very smart. She said, a man is someone you want to be standing next to when the enemy comes. That's what a man is. And I know that sounds horribly uh, regressive and, you know, et cetera, but um, I think those... I think those instincts run very, very deep in both men and women and play a big role in mate selection for both. Um, uh, and I think that the young men who don't have an opportunity to demonstrate that they're worthy, that they're courageous, um, I think there's a real, it's a real loss for them. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to fix it. The, I should say that there are sort of micro environments like, um, you know, poor urban, poor urban environments are extremely dangerous and extremely dangerous for young men. And, you know, I looked at a street gang in Chicago in the 1960s called the Vice Lords. And I was right in my book, Freedom. And, uh, you know, one way of defining freedom is that you are safe from the enemy. The enemy cannot just come in and kill you. And that's one form of freedom, very important form. And so, so the the vice lords were formed to protect these young men in a very violent and dangerous part of Chicago in the 1960s, a, 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 um, African-American men, right, young men. And there were these predatory gangs and, and all around, and so the vice lords were formed to protect the, by these young guys, to protect themselves. And the, they were completely egalitarian. It was a totally egalitarian group. The leaders were basically just people who were good at convincing other young men to do, to do something. And they weren't exempt. The, their leadership didn't give them any powers at all, right? They weren't exempt from anything. Um, and uh, the definition of it being a vice lord, the definition, the only one that mattered, was that if another vice lord was in danger, you ran towards him to help, no matter how terrible the odds were. And if you didn't, if you ran the other way to save yourself, you just weren't a vice lord. No problem. And they wouldn't kill you for that. They wouldn't beat you up. They would just put you in a car and they drive you to the center of the territory of the rival gang and just make you get out of the car. You don't want to be part of this group? Okay, no problem. You don't have a group. A see, sentence worse than death in some ways. Yeah, exactly. So I'd see how it goes for you not being part of a group, not being prepared to sacrifice for the other members of a group. See how that goes for you. And that's a very, very ancient thing. And so what, what I would say is that you're right. Young men don't have a chance to demonstrate their worthiness. They, they, we're, we, they don't have dangers, except in poor urban environments where it's extremely dangerous. And young men organize themselves in such a way that they can protect themselves. And often that organization turns into a criminal enterprise, which is dangerous in and of itself. So I mean, I mean there's ironies all over the place. But um, that is something that people do 
when they need to. And there's unfortunately, tragically, there are communities in this country where, you know, the, the, the death rate for young men is incredibly high and uh, from violence and uh, the murder rate's incredibly high and they will organize themselves accordingly. That's interesting. That's a, a great metric, I feel like, for trying to identify behavior as masculine or not masculine. I don't want us to say feminine as the antithesis to masculinity because right. I think that's a different thing, but I think mas- like being a man or being not a man. Yeah. And just the idea that would is this a self-serving behavior or is this serving the group? Because ultimately it seems like all of these definitions circle back on self-sacrifice. Yeah. And which is why it's so frustrating when you're doing you know a school project with someone that doesn't do any work. Because yeah. like, oh, you're in the group and you are trying to benefit from the group without giving anything at all to the group. Right. And people are incensed by it. It's in our core. When it happens, yeah. people are so enraged. And I don't even know if p- people really understand why it's so annoying. But they, it just is so palpable. Like, oh, I hate this person. Because they don't give anything of themselves and yeah. all they do is take from the group. It's deeply wired into us. Um, sort of the sort of freeloader problem, mm-hmm. right? It's deeply wired into us because it's a threat to our survival, right? And if you just think back into our sort of human... Our, pre, our sort of prehistory when um, food resources were, you know, much, much more marginal and survival was a continual endeavor that the whole group was, where the whole group was needed. Um, people that were willing to eat the, the food that was gathered collectively, hunted collectively and not contribute. Um, though they were freeloaders and they, it was, it's a tax on the group, right? It's a tax that in, 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 in desperate times they could, couldn't afford to be, Paid. So there's two big sort of social stressors, two big threats to a group uh, in that sense. There's the threat of abusive leadership, right? Someone who abuses their position of leadership to accumulate more than their fair share of the resources, um, of the social capital, whatever it may be, of the women, frankly, um, sort, of, sort of reproductive access. Um, and then there's... Um, the other, the other threat is the freeloader threat. So society is constantly on guard between sort of um, bullying, abusive alpha males that aren't just leaders, but are um, abusers and tyrants, right? And on the other hand, freeloaders who are sort of like skimming off the top and not doing their fair share. And, and society is organ- organized around protecting itself from those two like ancient, ancient threats. Hmm. And I guess the solution for a freeloader is isolation, right? Like, hey, you want to benefit from the group? Well, we will ostracize you from the group. And as we know, if you are alone, it's almost certain death. What is the solution for tyranny, right? That seems like a much more difficult uh, problem to curb. Well, it's interesting. So humans are the only species where a smaller individual can defeat a larger one in combat. Right, or a smaller group t- can defeat a larger group in combat, which means that freedom is possible. Like if the big guy always won every fight, uh, if, the, if, the, if the empire won every war, the world would be composed of fascist megastates. But it, do- it doesn't look like that, right? Because small groups can win and, um, and, and small adversaries, smaller adversaries can win. And one of the, um, one of the so in, 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 Sort of primate society, if you look at chimpanzees, invariably it's this sort of larger alpha male that that wins a fight. And and size is enormously important, of course. Um, and in humans, because of language, it's very easy to form coalitions where four or five guys actually are stronger than the biggest dude, right? It doesn't matter, mm-hmm. right? And with weapons, that's even more true. Right. So you can be four foot eight and kill a guy who's six foot eight with an arrow mm-hmm. or a spear, right? Or an obsidian knife. And so the solution to abusive leadership is assassination. I mean, in, in, in our human history, in our prehistory, sure. right? And so there's, there's a lot of evidence. There's a wonderful um, anthropologist named Bohm. Or is it Richard Bohm? I can't remember. Um, uh he writes. He's written a lot about this. That the the um, corrective for abusive leadership in many hunter gatherer societies, uh, and some that are still existing today, is you know a, a collective action where they just take out the abusive leader, and um, so it keeps people. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that small-scale hunter-gatherer societies, small-scale organic societies are quite egalitarian uh, because it's hard to accumulate the kind of power and, and, and resources that allow uh, a Saddam Hussein, a Vladimir Putin to control the society. It's quite hard to do that in a, in a mobile society, in a migratory society of 50, 100, 150 people. And why is it harder within a hunter-gatherer society? We, well, you, there's no way to accumulate things, right? If you, a mobile society, you, uh, you, know, you, you, you can't, you can't accumulate wealth. Like there's not, you, I mean, you can only accumulate what you can carry. In terms of long-term planning, yeah. there's no agriculture. You right. can't store up for all these seasons. Right. It's like we are going out, getting what we need for the next couple right. days and right. keeping it and then moving. And everyone involved can sustain themselves out of the natural world, right? Like, so if you're not a hunt and gather, you don't need to be part of the screw. I mean, you, everyone, everyone has access to the means of production, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very quote, low level of, uh, uh, of, of society in a way. I mean, it's very sophisticated as well. None of us could survive in the wild right now, mm. right? Um, but everyone has access to the mechanisms of survival, and so it's very hard for a leader to monopolize power. And, oh, that's so and interesting. You and can, you can just leave, right? Like, like all right, we're out of here. These small-scale hunter-gatherer societies kind of sort of hold like very quasi communist ideals that they are in control of the means of production from the yeah. group or from from nature itself yeah i mean the, i mean i think communism which clearly didn't work very well and uh um the um, I've, I've been married twice and the first woman i was married to was grew up in bulgaria and it was under communism and um it had a lot of it had a lot, a lot of things going for it, frankly, uh, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, but there was a, a nice sort of collectivism that felt very sort of good in human terms, um, and uh, but it didn't work. But they, but it, you know, you could say that it was it was trying to take the sort of the human norm for hundreds of thousands of years in small scale society and apply it to a country of millions or tens of right. millions of people. Do you think like a system like that? like some type of communist system could work on a super small scale, like 40, 50 people. Would you say that is ex effectively what hunter-gatherers had? Yeah, and I, th you know, it's, I mean, that's a, effectively a platoon, right? I mean, whatever. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, when, when, when people are in groups of 40 or 50, um, I mean, any, anytime you see a natural disaster in this country, you know, fire, a hurricane, a tornado, um, you see people spontaneously organize themselves in extremely egalitarian groups. And it doesn't mean there isn't someone who's sort of organizing things because they have the brain of an organizer and they're, and they're like, okay, you go there, you go there. But it doesn't mean that they have more, they have more authority, but they don't have more, um, they don't have more privilege, mm -hmm. right? That's the crucial thing. And um, you know, in some ways, even in America in general, uh, are the political leaders, they still, um, they don't, they don't have extra rights, right? They still have to obey the laws of the country, right? And that, that's a new idea. I mean, you're, you know, once you got agriculture eight, seven, 8,000 years ago, you had the rise of these city-states, extremely powerful leaders with, you know, armies of 20, 30, 40,000 men at arms. And, um, you know, clearly they had extra rights, Right, they you know the kings and queens of Europe were not, could not be held accountable by the serfs right. of Europe for murder and pillage and rape and all that other stuff. Like they were completely outside of the law in this country. I mean, the, the brilliant thing in 1776 uh, of of our our sort of forefathers that started this country, um, the brilliant idea was that the most powerful people in this country, the political leaders, the economic leaders, they all were subject to the same laws as the as the as the common man. And that was a mind blowing at the time. The, right. the, you know, the, the kings of the, the kings of Europe certainly didn't were not accountable to anything. It seems so obvious to us today. But that those documents with those ideas were yeah. re really revolutionary. And the framers were those powerful people, right? They were extremely influential, wealthy white men in America, in what in what became the United States. And they wrote themselves into that, right? They were saying, no, 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 we are accountable too. We're going to write a document that makes us accountable to these laws just like you are. Wow. And that was extraordinary. That is so interesting. And just that idea, I mean, obviously, I think we've all heard the quote that absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? That when people get this, these insurmountable amounts of power, they become evil. And yeah. people, you know, obviously will argue, oh, well, does it just show who they really were the whole time? Or does it truly corrupt 
even, you know, incorruptible people. I wonder if human beings throughout all of our years of evolution, homo sapiens, were we able, were we ever supposed to have as much power as we have now? Leaders of specific countries and leaders of, you know, factions and armies and things like that. Well, you, I mean, you need a system for organizing something that huge and complex, and you need people with authority that sort of run the business of the nation. Mm -hmm. And, but you can't give those people extra rights. Right. That's the thing. That makes sense. But even just power in general, I mean, thinking about, okay, our societies are larger than our brains have evolved for, right? Our brains have evolved for like that Dunbar number of whatever it is, right. 50 to 100 people. And, you know, agriculture is a new idea in, you know, the scope of human yeah. history. Like maybe that might be a mistake, like Jared Diamond would say. So all of these things that are contributing to like these collective societies that are forming, that are creating great amounts of power, and then leaders are now in charge of these massive amounts of power. Yeah. I don't know if human beings were ever supposed to have that much power. No, I mean, the, no, they weren't, right? But that does, but here we are, right? And we're making it work fairly well, right? Like, I mean, it, it's not continual warfare around the world. It's not, I mean, you know, that most, you know, most societies are fairly peaceable on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's sort of, I mean, miraculously, it's kind of working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you have to, um, you have to understand that leadership that selects for a certain kind of personality, right? And sometimes you, I, I hear people say, oh, if women ran the world, it would be very different. And I'm like, you know what? The, the male or female, the kinds of people who want to be leaders are generally certain kinds of striving sort of alpha personalities, right? So Sarah Palin was an alpha, right? I mean, an alpha female, but she was an she was an alpha, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene, likewise. Like these are these are people that are so ambitious they're almost predatory. And there's plenty of, plenty of men like that, and plenty of Democrats like that. I just named a couple of Republicans. But the, um, you know, I think Hillary Clinton was you know fairly predatory in her ambitions, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, and I met her once. She was a lovely lady. So I you know I want to speak ill of her, but you know, but I think it selects for a certain kind of personality. And so if you said. If you just replace all the leaders with women, you, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of you would not necessarily get all the sort of empathic ladies you're dreaming of, right? right you, yeah. you, you're going to get people who are like, no, I want to run this shit, it's right? Like saying like, replace all the warlords with women, it's like, well, to be a warlord, you're ruthless. You're going to have yeah. female warlords, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, the so that what you need, it, forget about male and female. There's there's plenty of men who are higher on the empathic scale than some women. Right. And and uh, so the question is, we want empathic leaders who are not just out to advantage themselves and who respect the, 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 the sacred treasure of a democratic system. They respect that and they they want to protect that more than they're interested in their own personal careers. Hmm. It just seems like our current system really benefits the individual in their personal pursuit to you know self-aggrandize and. Well, the, the anti-corruption laws are not strong enough. Like, you should not be able to trade. Congressmen should not be able to trade stock, right, right. Uh, that, that are affected by the laws that they pass. Like, come on. Yeah. Right? The, these mean, are the things to me that yeah. seem crazy. That, yeah, it is crazy. Yeah. It's totally crazy. Um, there's a wonderful book called They Knew by a woman named Sarah Kenzior, and you should really have her on your show. It's mm -hmm. an amazing, amazing book about conspiracy and conspiracy theory in this country. And, you know, she makes the different, she makes the distinction, right? There's plenty of conspiracies, right? I mean, real conspiracies. Like, mm -hmm. you could argue there's a sort of corporate conspiracy that disadvantages, as you watch the in income inequality grow in this country, that disadvantages sort of working people uh, for the benefit of corporate power. That's a conspiracy. I mean, you could argue that that's a real conspiracy. And I, I don't think you'd be wrong. She, so her book is absolutely brilliant. Sarah Kenzior, they knew. Hmm. It's really, um, he's a brilliant writer and an amazing researcher. So I, I totally agree with you about, about the sort of rigged nature of the, of the game. And the answer to that is just more anti-corruption laws. Well, whatever. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the answer to that is engagement, not disengagement. Right. At the end of the day, disengagement will not change any of that. Yeah. What's up, guys? We're going to take a break really quick because you need an attorney. Yeah. Maybe something happened, maybe you had a slip and fall, maybe you got on a fender bender, maybe some terrible thing happened to you, 
and you might be entitled to compensation. Now, here's the problem anytime something bad happened to me. I got hit by a car. I got in a car accident. I slipped down the stairs after they were cleaning it, didn't put a sign up. I had to try to find an attorney, and I had to go through Google, and I had to search through all these sketchy attorneys. I had no idea what I was looking at. I didn't know if they were trusted. I didn't know if they had a national brand, and I didn't know if they were going to actually fight to get me the compensation I needed or if they were just trying to personally ingrandize themselves and take money from me. And that is why I wish I knew about Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest personal injury law firm. That's right, over 100 offices nationwide and more than 800 attorneys, they are waiting to hear from you and waiting to hear the claims that you could submit. They have received over $15 billion, that's right, $15 billion recovered for their clients. Now that's crazy. Now I'm sure you're thinking, okay, sure, this is a big law firm and they do a good job. But how do I know they're going to do a good job for me? Here's how you know. They won't charge you a cent unless they win your case. That's right. You win, they win. That's all they care about. You get nothing, they get nothing. Your interests are completely mutually aligned. So if you're interested in getting involved with Morgan & Morgan, they don't charge you a fee unless they win your case. I'm sure you're thinking, whoa, that's crazy, but it must be a whole hassle to get a hold of them. And you're wrong again. I'm so sorry. This is your fourth time being wrong in one ad read. To submit a claim, it's more like, I don't know, buying something off Amazon, ordering an Uber. It's eight clicks or less, and you could submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. You don't need to know anything else. That is everything you need to know. I know these guys. I know, I know Morgan & Morgan. I'm from Florida. They're very popular down there. Trust me. These are the guys you want to go with if you are ever injured. And if you want to check that out, you go to for the people, F O R the people.com slash Gagnon. That's correct. That is for the people, F O R the people.com slash Gagnon, G A G N O N, or you dial pound law. That's pound 529 from your cell phone. This is a paid advertisement. That's how you know they're legit. They're willing to tell you, like, yo, we paid some money for this, we, we threw some bucks up. That's how confident they are they can win your case. They're not even worried about it. So if you're ever injured, check them out, forthepeople.com or dial pound law, pound 529 from your cell phone. Now let's get back to the show. I sometimes get conflicted between this place of being an American citizen, being someone that grew up here and benefiting so much from everything this country offers. And people will say, oh, well, you know, for the reason we have all these things and the reason why gas is how much this is and the reason we have these iPhones, you don't, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but the reason why some of us have all these iPhones, these amazing things is because of this, you know, global conquest that we've gone on and, you know, policing the world and going out and fighting wars across the world and giving freedom and democracy to all these other countries. And I'm curious, how do you square this idea of, you know, am I complicit in America's malevolent actions around the world? just by virtue of living here, is that okay? Right. Uh, should I be in protest of these things and try to remove myself from the you know foreign policy issues that I don't agree with? What are your thoughts? Well, the people that are saying that are also benefiting from those same things, mm -hmm. right? I'm assuming some of them own cars. I'm assuming they all live indoors. Sure. Right, they probably don't grow their own food. You know, they probably buy things that are part of a, um, uh, an economic tra trail that leads all around the world, right? Like, so so uh, a supply chain that involves, like, every area, region of the world that is then protected by the U.S. Navy so the trade goods and oil can reach our shores and then our national product can reach other people's shores. Like, that's all dependent on the Navy protecting it from piracy, which is a huge problem in some areas of the, some, uh, of the world. So, so those same critics are benefiting just as much as you are from all those systems that they have a moral disagreement with, right? Mm -hmm. So what I, you know, what I would say is that the, I mean, the America has acted very, very well in the world and very poorly, right? And so I would say is that the, it, it, you're never going to live in some uh, perfect sort of vacuum where you're not participating in the sort of machinery of this country, right? If you have a car, if you live indoors, if you eat food, you didn't grow up, whatever, you're, you're part of it, right? There's no way, there's no way out. So figure out how to elect and pressure a government that responds more morally than not, in the, that acts more morally than not in the world. I mean, our actions in World War I were enormously moral, right? I mean, we lost um, tens, hundreds of thousands of, soldiers to stop fascism, right? And 
Um, do, do we get dragged into that war because of Pearl Harbor? Yeah, we didn't want to enter the war. But once we did, like we really, um, we protected something very, very sacred, which was human dignity around the world. We protected it from fascism. Mm -hmm. And so, and we've, you know, and then, and then we went on to um, topple one democratically elected government after another in Central and South America and put dictators in their place, dictators who like tortured and killed people. That was us. We did that, right? Yeah. Like, so, so what do you, you know, what do you do? You, you, you participate in, in this country and try to steer it towards righteous action. Hmm. That just, it seems like a big ship to steer. From, right, it is, from but, what's the alter but what's the alternative? Yeah. Because if you just do nothing, you're still part of that system that's acting in ways that you think are abhorrent. Right. Yeah, I guess my general assumption, maybe this is, it's good to discuss, but it just seems like an exercise of futility to try to change, you know, the CIA overthrowing, you know, some dictator or, so, or some president in some country and putting in an American dictator, whatever that is. It feels like, what am I going to do? Even if I, we elect the nicest guy in the world, you know, the players that are working behind the scenes to, you know, institute American foreign policy are still going to do what they're going to do. And maybe what they should do is for the best for me yeah. and for America. I don't know. Well, look, I mean, you could say that about women's rights and civil rights and um, the whole movement in the last century, labor rights, the whole movement in the last century in this country towards individual rights mm -hmm. for people and people who did not have a lot of power, right? Um, all of that happened despite, you know, a reason, sort of, an, a, you know, totally reasonable attitude, like you said, of like, how, we're not going to change this, right? Like, and yet we did, hmm. right? All of those things changed profoundly, even in my lifetime. I mean, in the 1970s, there were still miscegenation laws in this country, meaning you people could not marry between races in the 1970s. Yeah, that's right? wild. I, I mean, I was a teenager. Right. So things do change and they have changed in this country and around the world in many ways for the better. Um, and so I think at every point it looks hopeless, but actually that if you look backwards in history, that's actually not the case. Um, we are much better off than we were under the kings and queens of Europe, mm -hmm. just in terms of basic human rights. Yeah. No, that's good perspective. I I don't know. Maybe it's a generational thing, or maybe it's just the my you know my parents are kind of uh, anti-establishment in a lot of ways. Right. So I wonder if it's maybe my personal upbringing. But yeah, just having this idea as I'm growing up that I kind of grew up in the time where America, there's no more just wars. You know what I mean? Like America's fought all the just wars. They fought the fascism, and now they're into this global imperialism right. that. It, you know, it makes America the bad guy of the world. And right. now me as a citizen, I'm responsible for the sins of that country. And it just created a lot of conflict. But I guess the idea that, yeah, what other options do you have other than... Yeah, because you're responsible whether you engage or not. So right. you might as well engage. Right, and try to steer it in a in the yeah. right way. Yeah. And in your opinion, what criteria do you have, you know, even going back to your dad's advice of, you know, you should fight the just wars and protest the unjust wars. What is your criteria for understanding if a war is just or unjust? Um, I mean, I think just war theory is that we're obligated to fight wars where um, human dignity, human life is at stake. Mm -hmm. And if someone is acting in a predatory way towards a civilian population, if a country is, is acting in a predatory way towards a civilian population, even their own population, uh, we're morally obligated to intervene. Um, Russia invading Ukraine was a deeply immoral act, mm -hmm. right? And uh, if my father were alive today, I'm sure he would say we must do everything we can to protect Ukraine from and any other country that's invaded from predatory acts like that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I guess if someone is... Yeah, I go back and forth. I guess people will say, oh, we shouldn't be playing police of the world. And to that, I would be like, well, if someone's doing something inherently evil that we can see, you know, if there's some type of Holocaust happening, we should probably step in. Well, it's, you know, morally, it's an interesting thing to say, because what they're saying is, I want police in my town. Right. But I don't think the world deserves police. Right. And if the, like, they're, they're, why do you, why should you get police in your town? Right? Like, why should you be protected from, by the police, from violent predators? Because it's the right, it's the decent moral right thing to do. It's the way society should be run to protect people from violent predators, right? But if if 
if that's true at, at a small scale in your town, why is that not true in your state? And if it's not true, in, if it's true in your state, why is it not true in your country? And if it's true in your country, why is it not true in the world? Hmm. Right? Like, I, I don't, I don't understand the moral logic there, other than someone saying, "Look, I don't give a shit about anybody else. I just want to be safe and okay. Go away." Interesting. That is an interesting way to frame it. Once you really make it micro, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, you know, if, look, if you heard someone beating up their wife in the neighboring apartment, what would you do? Go knock on the door, say, hey, what's going on? I'd, right. I'd call the police. I'd try to intervene. Right. So yeah. you would call someone, understand you would call someone who is carrying a weapon <laughs> and is, you know, like, um, has been uh, given the legal responsibility of using deadly force if necessary to protect the common good and protect innocent people. Mm -hmm. That's who you would call. Right. So, and, I, and, and, and good on you, right? Exactly. It's exactly what you should do, right? And uh, if you're not going to intervene yourself personally, I mean, say you don't believe in violence, right? So you're not going to get into a fight with this guy, right? Okay, no problem. Call the cops. But when you call the cops, you're calling people who are, um, who have who have been um, mandated to use violence if necessary, mm -hmm. right? And if that's a moral act, then how is the intervention in Bosnia not a moral act, right? How is staying out of Rwanda? A moral act. A million people were killed with machetes, something we could have stopped qu quite easily. Um, I was in the civil war in Liberia, and 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 and, and the, you know, we that war was stopped literally without a shot being fired by um, a West African peacekeeping force and U.S. Marines coming ashore. Like as soon as they came ashore, the war stopped. Thousands of people had been killed. Wow. Right. So. You know what's 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 good. For, you know what's sort of good for for you for your town is good for the world. And um, you know, at the end of the day, um, human suffering is an abomination. The the the, the um, insult to human dignity is an abomination for everybody. And saying, "Oh, I, well, I just don't want to get involved." When you say that, you actually are involved in the worst possible way. You're aiding right. and abetting it. This idea that neutrality is favoring the side of the, you know, the predator, the yeah, oppressor. As, as it would be if you heard someone beating, you know, a man beating up his, beating up his wife in, in the neighboring apartment. Oh, no, I'm not going to get involved. Uh, you're, you are involved now. Hmm. You're involved by letting it go on. Yeah. Sorry. No, that makes a lot of sense. That that makes complete sense, especially in issues that are like very morally black and white, right? Where it's like, hey, there's a Holocaust happening where, you know, a dictator is exterminating an entire, yeah. you know, ethnic group of people. Like, we need to do something about this. This is insane. Well, I guess it becomes murky when it's like, all right, what is really happening? Is there good <laughs> intel? Are there really weapons of mass destruction? Like, what is actually going on? And I guess that just opens up a, a bigger conversation of intelligence. But... I guess you can really only make the right decision with the information you have at the time, right? And you just have to trust yeah. that the people making the, those decisions are truly acting in the benefit of the country and not for some type of personal benefit. Right. And, I, you know, personally, I think that the, the invasion of Iraq was a totally travesty, right? Mm -hmm. A huge mistake. And hundreds of thousands of people died who didn't need to die. And, you know, I mean, I'm totally, totally against it. Yeah. I guess that equivalent would be like you hear your neighbor beating up his wife and then you open the door and you start beating everyone up, and really they were like dancing or something. You're right. you know what I mean? And you're like, yeah. oh, my bad. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, a, you know, I mean, Hussein was a dictator, and he was a horrible man. It wasn't, sure. you know, but there's plenty of dictators, and plenty of them we are perfectly fine with. So, I, I you know, I, no, I the, the, the dishonesty and of that war um, is, is I, I, not Afghanistan, but Iraq was mm -hmm. appalling. Yeah. And did that shake your confidence in America as, you know, a national or a global force for good at all? Well, I, I mean, it, it made me think that the Bush administration um, was was un, unwise and hubristic and self-serving in some way. Right. And but America is whatever. I mean, America is it, it's not one thing. Right. It's like what I mean, it, it's it, it, America is what it as it acts now and in a decent administration i you know i don't i don't think the gore the gore administration would have invaded iraq right al gore mm -hmm. who was defeated by george george mm -hmm. bush in 2000 um so it's not like america is or isn't it, you know you, you have to look at the uh, the the leaders yeah 
and those leaders turn over so quickly. Part of me, and maybe this is like partially conspiratorial, but like my general feeling is that, you know, the leaders kind of change in and out. Right? These presidents get elected and they sort of act as like the face of the nation. Yeah. Where, uh, and where I guess like the people that are making a lot of like the military decisions or a lot of like the intelligence are all in there for, you know, tenured positions. They might be there for 20, 30 years, kind of working behind the scenes to ensure the stability of the nation, right? Turning over a leader every four, eight years right. might lead to instability within a country. So there has to be people sort of working within the framework to maintain it. And there's institutional knowledge, right? Like, right. Do, would you, do, you, do you really want to swap out the head of the, the IRS every four years? Probably not, right? right. I mean, imagine. <laughs> like, right. So, yeah, so yeah. So I'm curious, within your understanding, how much influence do you think the president has when it comes to foreign policy like that? How much of that do you think comes from people behind the scenes? Do you think it changes within administrations? Well, I think they have huge influence. I mean, I think the president has enormous influence on foreign pol policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, look what look at Iraq. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it right. seems obvious. But then part of me is like, you know, if Biden is in there and, you know, he might not be in the best mental state, are the people that are kind of running the show behind the scenes sort of l taking less input from him? Just on a personal level, I'm I mean, curious he what has your thoughts the, are. I mean, he he's um, he is as George Bush called himself the decider, right? George Bush said, "I'm the decider, and this is what's happening." Yeah. and he was right because the the way the the laws of this country are constructed, he has the power to do that, and uh, and Congress then has the power to say, "You know what? Not so fast. We're going to recall." Uh, it might take some months, but we are gonna we we're gonna rewind this. We're not gonna do this. Right. Mm -hmm. So this the that's the um, push and pull of uh, the democratic system. But um, uh, it, uh, you know, Biden. I mean, the reason we're supporting Ukraine with weapons is because of Biden, mm -hmm. right? It's not because there's some State Department functionary that's like sliding billions of dollars of weapons over there. It's because Joe Biden is like, what, we're going to do this. This is important for this country, for democracy, for the world. Um, uh, Russia's an uh, um, ongoing threat uh, to all its neighboring countries, and um, we're going to stop them here because if we don't, we're going to have to stop them in Poland. Hmm. Interesting. Do you support the idea of, of giving weapons and aid like that to Ukraine? Do you think that's the most effective way the U.S. can be supported? Or do you think there's other ways that would be more effective? Uh, you know, as they say, the, the, the pen is mightier than the sword unless your opponent has a sword, right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, we, yeah, we need to give Ukraine a sword to fight the Russians. They're, just, they're, they're not going to—they um, might win eventually, but the— um, the the cost the cost in human terms of a Russian occupation of, of Ukraine is so astronomical, um, it's on you can't even you, you can't even really contemplate it. What is at stake? I'm sorry. What is at stake with you know ru like Russia invading Ukraine and let's say Ukraine turns over into Russian control? What is at stake globally? Oh, I think you know I think there would be a real pogrom. Uh, I mean, the Russian you know sort of nationalist Russian leaders are already talking about killing millions of Ukrainians. Uh, to subordinate that country if they ever finally take control, which they're not, thank God. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, like extreme, extreme oppression, uh, extreme uh, um, violation of human rights to control. I mean, it's a it's a population of forty million people. You're, I mean, like Saddam Hussein in Iraq, you're going to have to use some pretty severe measures to keep that population under control, and then even then, you probably won't even really be able to do it. Um, just incalculable human costs. And, um, you know, Russia invaded um, Georgia in 2008. Uh, they got involved in Transnistria and Moldova early on. Um, uh, Nagora Karabakh. Uh, uh, there's a string of uh, Chechnya, of course, two wars in Chechnya. I mean, Russia has been destabilizing, taking over and invading satellite countries around them for, you know, coming on 20 years now. Without right. any response from NATO, mm -hmm. finally in Ukraine, a dem you know a, a democracy like a fledgling democracy, uh, a sophisticated country uh, in your in basically in Europe that um, that um, has the right to be self defining, and they just invaded them. They were just going to take them over, right? And it's like we don't get to invade Mexico either. Like it's just not how it works, and uh, so I think. Um, the, 
the consequences for the world if that had if that Russian strategy of just invading neighboring countries and making them the sort of vassal states, if that had if that had worked on the scale of Ukraine, forty some million people, right on the edge of of Europe and NATO, I think that would have been an extremely dangerous situation. Hmm. And what do you think Putin's calculation was for the invasion? Oh, I think it was like George Bush, Bush with Iraq. Oh, we're going to, you know, there'll be a few uh, miscreants, but basically the population will welcome us. There, there is, uh, I think Putin was thinking of Ukraine. It's like they're, they're now is basically a spoiled, affluent Western country. They can have no stomach for a real fight. And, you know, the Russian serfs that make up most of the mili Russian military um, are, you know, are um, like the, the Putin clearly doesn't care about casualties. And I think he imagined that the Ukrainian society would. Of course, they do. Um, but that the disparity in what Rus Russia was willing to lose and what the Ukrainians were willing to lose, the disparity would be so great that they would take that the Ukrainians would give up. And hmm. that did that did not happen. And, and I, you know, I also think he thought he would take over that country in a couple of weeks. And that was um, in part partly because of our America's good efforts with special forces teams in Ukraine starting in 2014 like training the Ukrainians how to resist an, a, a Russian invasion. Um, uh, you know, that was almost almost a decade of like high level military instruction within the Ukrainian military by our best like special forces guys. Right. So, you know, that that has an effect that has a real that has real consequences. So surely he must have anticipated America's support of Ukraine right through, you know, weapons, money. And like this kind of proxy war that we're in, like, do you think he didn't? I think he thought it was going to happen so fast. In a couple of weeks, they were going to take, they were going to de decapitate the Ukrainian government, um, uh, kill whoever they needed to, kill Zelensky, surely kill Zelensky, and you know the country would be paralyzed and they'd just take it over. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't, it, it, it wasn't. I don't think he thought that they would go on long enough for us to really support them. Why do you think he chose now, or not now, or you know, a year a year and a half ago, whenever it, ha whenever it started? Why do you think he chose that time? I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it would have been a lot easier, I think, if Donald Trump were president for Putin to have done that. Um, right. And then Trump lost. And, you know, I think it took him maybe a couple of years to get spun up after that setback. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, because it seems like, you know, if him and Trump have some type of positive relationship, that he would have more leverage in this situation to try to, you know, take it over. And especially because I guess the Ukrainian resistance wasn't as strong when Trump was president, right? Like before, like it, it inevitably got stronger post-2020. So I yeah. wonder what what his weight was. Do you think there's anything concerning his personal health that... Uh, Putin's personal health. I, 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 mean, I don't know. I mean, I just have no way of knowing any of that. I mean, yeah. I read the New York Times every day. That's about it. Yeah. So I know whatever, whatever the New York Times knows. Sure. I'm curious. Have you seen the footage coming out from that war specifically? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. It's that is. So I watched Restrepo <clears throat> when I was in college, like early college, as a part of a class, and the footage was obviously like like immersive and terrifying and shocking and beautiful in a lot of different ways. And it's an amazing film. And like, the only thing that I've seen recently that even compared to that type of footage was the footage coming out of Ukraine yeah. and these soldiers wearing body cameras and drones with cameras on them, you know, dropping grenades and things like that. Yeah. I'm curious when you saw the footage, did it bring you back to that time when you were in Afghanistan? I mean, the style of combat was different. I mean, this is like trench warfare. And so the, um, and it was, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of tanks and armored vehicles, which were basically non-existent in Afghanistan when I was there with American soldiers. So the visuals were different in that sense. <clears throat> um, just on a sort of technical level, when you have a body camera, like on your helmet, you just, wherever your head's pointing is where you're shooting. And it makes for very jerky, confusing um, footage with a video camera. We shot to tape. Tim and I shot to tape uh, with a video camera that's in your hands. Your, your head can swing all over the place and your hands remain steady, focused on, you know, one in one direction. And so it gives a 
continuity to the footage that's actually a little easier to understand and to watch. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it was the footage is quite different. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess just when I saw it, just the intensity of what was happening yeah. and, and the rawness is yeah. what really struck me. Yeah. And the fact that this really seems like the first like live streamed war. I've heard people describe it that way. Yeah. You know, this is a war that, you know, everyone can see and is getting distributed online in real time and is being disseminated across social media. And many other wars in the past, you know, like the ones you've documented, a lot of that footage can only get out through some type of like organized means. Right. And now, you know, anyone can see this footage. And I wonder how that affects the psyche of the countries that are involved. Have you, have you thought about that at all? Yeah. Like, you know, uh, Ukrainians seeing the footage or yeah. Russians seeing the footage or even Americans <clears throat> seeing it. Well, you know, the footage, I'm assuming it's sort of vetted by the Ukrainian military and they're putting footage out <clears throat> that um, sort of supports the, supports the war effort on sort of like moral, moral and emotional level. And, uh, um, so, uh, and that, so that's a form of propaganda, right? And, and propaganda has always been part of any, any war effort. And, you know, Restrepo, my film, I mean, Tim's film, obviously wasn't propaganda. Uh, it had the, the U.S. military did not vet any of it. And, um, and, uh, and we weren't for or against the war, right? I mean, we're just, whatever. We were just showing what it was like. And, <clears throat> you know, there's a real difference between footage combat footage and a, an edited documentary because you can be uh, emotionally very manipulative when you edit footage together into a film. And we were trying to be manipulative in the sense that we wanted people to feel things, but we certainly were not trying to manipulate people into having an opinion about the war that was for or against. We just wanted them to empathize with the sol American soldiers who were fighting. And, um, and you could empathize with them whether you for or against the war. That wasn't, you know, one of the things we were trying to do. And clearly the Ukrainian military is trying to, like, you know, keep public opinion sort of buoyed up so that there's, that people don't despair. It's, you know, it's a year and a half into a terrible, terrible war. Despair is a real factor. Yeah, that's interesting. What is your opinion on storytelling when it comes to wars? Like, when it comes to creating <laughs> uh, morale for the for the people? Like, I think when... Uh, Putin first invaded Ukraine. There's a lot of stories about like the ghost of Kiev, and there was you know stories yeah, yeah. of uh, of you know these really brave people right at the yeah. onset. And there was obviously discussion like, oh, are these things real or not? And I don't know if it even matters so long as it's real in the hearts of people that believe it. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I think human society since the beginning ha has venerated its heroes because they're inspiring, and we all depend on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, 343. Fireman died 20 years ago yesterday, 22 years ago yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Um, and society society needs heroes because life is dangerous and hard and, you know, that's just... So, you know, of course, during a war, those people get talked about. Yeah. It, 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 it makes sense. It's adaptive, right? It, they're rallying point. They're moral rallying points for the society in a time of darkness. And even more than heroes, you need storytellers that can tell the stories of the heroes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and get the story out to the people that it's gonna benefit. Yeah. Well, and the story invariably is, um, look look, the, look at that individual. He's putting the country ahead of himself or herself, right? Watch that, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's heroism. And, and that has to be pointed out, right? I mean, that's what the, that, that invariably what the story is. You know, or the other part of it, the collective version is, look at us all working together to, um, to make this happen. Look at all the women in the, fa in the, you know, the, the weapons factories, the ammunition factories in, in, in America in the 1940s, like um, building the airplanes, building the bombs that the men are going to use to defend the country. You know, there's that sort of collective... There's that collective propaganda as well. And it's true, right? I mean, it's a, it sounds like a manipulation, but you know what? The humans have always functioned that way. The group defends itself. Right. We just happen to be in a group of 400 million. But, you know, it's still, it's like that's the human, the human norm. And being part of something like that, um, are you being manipulated? Yeah, in a, in a sense. But, you're, you know, you're also being, you're also participating in something that's like really ancient and human. And it can feel pretty intoxicating. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important 
I think it's important specifically for the public, but I think it's also important for the soldiers themselves. Like in the time that you've spent with, you know, actually on the ground in war zones, are there stories and people that the men that you're with are venerating uh, either within, you know, the groups themselves or within other groups that they've heard about in order to keep morale high? Well, the, so like at the sort of unit level, there was some great footage from uh, uh, from uh, from Ukraine. There were some Ukrainian soldiers who were fighting very, very hard in the trench and they're getting attacked uh, by Russians, right? And it was a crazy firefight. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, all the trees are splintered and everything. It just looks like World War I, right? And, and, it's, and they repelled the attack. <laughs> and one of the... One of the, one of the uh, Ukrainians yelled, yelled out, to, you know, because they could hear each other. The, the Russians weren't very far away. Yelled out, um, uh, <laughs> fuck off, this is our field. <laughs> really local, right? <laughs> this is our field. Like, fuck off, Russians. This is our field. That's so funny. Right? So it's very, very local. Like, when you get down to, you, know, you talk about nations fighting. Yeah. When you get down to what fighting is actually like, it's extremely local. It's a friggin' neighborhood, right? It's a field. This is our field. Go away. Yeah. Right? And um, so when, with the, the platoon of U.S. infantry that I was with off and on for a year in 07, 08, with my colleague Tim Hetherington that resulted in the movie Restrepo and my book War, um, you, know, there, you know, within the, within the company, battle company, there was a kind of venerating of some of the soldiers because they were really good soldiers, right? There was a guy named Larry Rugel, Sergeant Rugel, who got killed, who was killed, but he was just, you know, among his, I mean, among the other soldiers in that unit, he was just sort of a god, right? Like, oh my God, Rugel can do anything. Like he's, he's and he, he, he wasn't invincible. He got a bullet in the forehead, right? You know, and so, but, but, um, so, the, you know, within the group, there is this, this sort of like uplifting of some of the soldiers as like, as long as Sergeant Rice is here, we're going to be okay. You know, whatever. And what were the qualities of Rule that made him so venerated amongst the group? I mean, he was just a tough son of a bitch. He could walk all day long. He could carry 200 pounds. He was a great shot. He didn't, he wasn't scared of dying. You know, whatever. He was just a tough bastard. Everything. Yeah, everything. Including self-sacrifice. Yeah. He would have given yeah. his life for any one of those guys. Yeah. I mean, he was a scout leader, right? So, and the scouts were, um, they sort of operated, uh, outside of the like front line, quote in quotes front lines um and so they were very mobile and they were often behind the enemy and the mountain peaks and stuff and they moved very fast and uh um uh and he was the you know he was a staff sergeant in the scouts and so i mean it wouldn't i mean the the the, the men under his command um i don't think would have crossed his mind to protect himself if they were exposed, right? I mean, and any of the, I mean, all of the, I mean, all of the officers, he wasn't an officer, but all the officers were all also the same way. Like, they, I mean, they had, they, their paramount concern was the, 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 the men under their charge. Um, and, and for the men under their charge, those men also, their paramount concern was each other, you know, with a couple of exceptions that, you know, were sort of like talked about and those guys were sort of removed. Hmm. Now, I know you've spent time with obviously a lot of American troops and different platoons. Have you, you spent time with non-US forces as well, right? And rebel oh, most of my experience is- Rebel with, forces. Yeah, and, that's most of my experience. I've only been with one, only once. I've only been with the U, US military briefly in 2005 and then off and, off and on for a year in 07, 08. Oh, interesting. I thought it was more than that. No, no, no. I, I mean, I grew up during Vietnam and it never occurred to me that I would be interested in covering the U.S. military, right? I mean, it just like never crossed my mind, but I was in plenty of wars. Mm -hmm. They were just wars that the U.S. had nothing to do with. And did you find a lot of similarity amongst all the groups that you were with, all the different soldiers you were with? Do you find that there is a, a very common human primal ethos amongst all of them when it comes to facing imminent death, the enemy, war, things like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, there's a very, very powerful bond that develops and, um, you know, U.S., American soldiers are extremely well trained, right? Compared to say child soldiers in Liberia, but they're still there's there there's a sort of um, spirit in in these fighting groups that um, and in the vice lords in Chicago in the '60s, I'm sure as well, right? There's a kind of spirit of, you know, this is us, and 
<clears throat> any one of us would do anything to protect us. Like, and, and if you're not feeling that way, then you're really not part of us. And and that and that I think is common to any any group that's facing an existential threat. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find that they structure hierarchically similar ways? Well, the military. I mean, yeah, there's a chain of command, and it's sort of implemented. Um, but there's also this sort of authority of um, there's a kind of de facto unofficial authority that um, sol soldiers can have, even if they're like a specialist or something, right? I mean, they're just people that, you know, in a group of men, there's men that other men respect. Like, it's just, it's a sort of inborn quality. And it doesn't mean that they're a leader. It just might mean that they're quietly, they have their shit together and they're trusted. And But it's interesting that those things cross cultures. You know what I mean? Whether you're yeah. with, you know, Liberians <clears throat> or Americans or Afghans, the the common idea of selflessness, being tough as hell and being able yeah. to do physically demanding <clears throat> things will get you respect across everything. Are there cultural things that you found within specific factions that you're like, oh, that's interesting. In the U.S., that wouldn't have garnered respect, but over here it did. I, you know, I think those are human ideals that are just pretty universal. Like, I mean, you know, you want people that are, no one likes someone who's selfish mm -hmm. and 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 self-concerned and, and like doesn't care about anybody else. I mean, that's toxic in any circumstance. Right. It just the consequences are higher in war. Right. Um, but that's, you know, that doesn't feel good to anybody mm -hmm. in any context. Were there any cultural things, though, you saw amongst like, you know, like, oh, the, the Afghans, like the guy that looks this way or is tall like this or like some type of like interesting cultural quirk garnered him respect amongst the people? In almost like a folklore sense or something connected to the history of that place. You know, I didn't speak the language, so it was sort of hard to tell, mm -hmm. you know, what was going on. Um, uh, I, I assume it worked the same way with the Afghans. Yeah. Yeah. But that common base level primal thing, everyone yeah. gets on board with. Yeah. I w there was, um, what was this guy's name? There was a Northern Alliance leader. I can't remember his name. Anyway, he, you know, he was quite a prominent leader by the time I got there. But during the, um, after the Soviets pulled out, there was the, uh, the Civil War started. And there was, I saw footage that was shot in, you know, 99 or something like that. Of a um, of Afghan storming an enemy trench, you know, assaulting a trench is pretty hair raising business, right? I mean, the the gun emplacements are protected, and the the enemy's shooting from a, you know, from from protection, shooting belt fed machine guns from protection as you run at them, right? You can imagine how that goes, right? And so, this um, damn, I wish I could remember his name. Anyway, so in the footage, there's this one soldier advances under fire, leaps into the like throws a grenade, leaps into the trench, and kills everybody. He's by himself, right? That guy became one of Masood's top commanders. So, and there he was. He, you know, he was a like that. So that's a leader, right? Like he, I mean, he was, um, he was, he was leading the assault as not from behind, right? He was, he was literally in front of it and took out a trench of enemy fighters by himself. Wow. Right. So, if you you know, what do you think? Was that guy admired or not? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like unbelievably brave. Yeah. Now, when you were actually boots on the ground in these environments, how are you garnering respect from them? Is there do you have to do anything in order to earn their respect in order to sort of immerse yourself amongst the group? I mean, just don't complain. Don't slow the group down. If you're on a combat patrol, you for God's sakes, you don't want to be a problem. Right. I, I mean, um, be very imitative. If everyone's taking a knee, take a knee. If no one's talking, don't friggin' talk. Like, just don't do anything that's gonna, because you're not being asked to defend the group, right? You're just being asked to not get anyone killed, right? right. And and uh, or or just slow anything, slow anything down. Be a problem. So the first thing that's your first duty is to just not be a problem. And then on top of that, if you're if you're funny and you're a nice guy and you're worth being friends with, that's gonna go a long way. Like it does if you're the, a new kid in high school, right? Mm -hmm. So, Have there ever been times where you were a problem, where you accidentally made a mistake, where you did slow the group down? No. Never? No. Oh, wow. No. That, that's great. What would have been the consequence if you had done something like that? Would you have just been like, hey, you got to go? Get, get oh, you know, it's a how big a problem, right? But, I'm, I, you know, I was, I was pretty fit, and I could, I could keep up with those guys. I wasn't carrying as much of them. I mean, I was twice their age, but I was probably carrying half their weight. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, they're, 
you know, the, the heavy machine gunner, you know, the 240 gunner is carrying, you know, the ammo bearer is carrying, you know, 80 pounds of ammo on top of his other shit, right? Like, so, yeah. I mean, so, you know, like, in, at 45, you know, that's not you know, that's not happening. But I was, but I was fit enough to keep up with them in any circumstances. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I was also, a, you know, a, a pretty intense athlete when I was young, so I know how to hurt. You know what I mean? I know right. I know how to make my body perform until it collapses. Get in the pain cave yeah. and kind of dig deep. Right. Yeah. And if your body just physically collapses, then they'll take care of you. Like they collapse too. I mean, whatever. Like it's not like they're they're in you know superhuman. So, but what they don't want to see is someone babying themselves because it this doesn't feel very good. Right. Yeah. Like they don't want to see that. If you just collapse from heat prostration or whatever, uh, that's not your fault. And, and of course they would take care of you, but that's not, so, but what you do, you know, and as an athlete, I could make myself, I could force my body to do things up to the point of collapse. Right. And, and that helps. It helps, a, <laughs> helps a lot. What's up guys. We're going to take a break really quick because it is extremely difficult to cut anything cold turkey. Yeah. Especially some of those habits or bad habits you have that are probably impossible to break. Some of them are scientifically proven to be extremely hard to break. Yeah, you know the ones I'm talking about. <sighs> but then you can try Fume. If you have a problem breaking your bad habits, you need to check out Fume. I love Fume for a few reasons. If you've never heard of Fume, it is an award-winning device. This is it right here in my hands. It is beautiful. It is sleek. If you know me, I get a little anxious sometimes. I like to play with the Fume. It's got this little... Uh, twistable dial right here. Here's a little ASMR demonstration for you. It's got this twistable dial. It's just fun to fidget with. It's fun to play with. It's fun to look at. But not only that, the primary purpose of Fume is it is packed with breathable, fresh flavored air packets. That's right. Fume, instead of using electronics, it's completely natural. Instead of vapor, it's flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, it is all natural, delicious flavors. Right now in here, I have the mint packet. It's my favorite one. Every time I take a deep breath, it helps me focus on relaxing. It connects me to my breathing. It makes me feel very chill. It calms my anxiety. Anytime I'm anxious before a show, before a pod, I take out my fume and I completely and instantly feel relaxed. You know, I was never one that was big on, you know, any of these other products that are bad for you, that have, you know, harmful chemicals, they use electronics. But when I found out about Fume and I said, okay, wait, a healthy way that I can reduce my anxiety, something to fidget with, something to play with, and something to do throughout the day that makes me focus on my breathing, yeah, that's a no-brainer. So if you are interested in trying Fume, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to tryfume, T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and I want you to check out the Journey Pack. The Journey Pack is going to give you everything you need to get started from separating the bad from your habits. Take the bad out. Just have a habit like Fume. This is a habit that will make you feel good reduce your anxiety. And if you use the code GAGNON, G-A-G-N-O-N, you will save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. Check that out right now. I'm telling you, if you are interested in taking the bad out of your habits, taking control of your health, and focusing on reducing your anxiety through breath, flavored air, it makes you feel good, you need to go to tryfume, T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, use the code GAGNON, G-A-G-N-O-N, when you get the journey pack. That'll help you save 10% off. Check it out. Let's get back to the show. Who were the most impressive leaders that you worked with in all the different, you know, platoons and things that you were? I was only with one platoon. Or okay. I guess uh, yeah. not, not necessarily platoon, <clears throat> sorry. I, again, amongst all the different groups that you were observing, all the different war factions. factions. I mean, Masood was a, just a genius, right? He was, he was, and he was running a whole society. What Not only was the, he the supreme military commander, but he was basically the... Um, the overall civilian leader of of the area of, of Afghanistan that was liberated from Taliban control. But a true genius. Yeah, he he was. I mean, he studied. In, you know, he studied in West Point or whatever. Like, he, I mean, he's uh, he was pretty brilliant. Wow. And what things was he doing that impressed you the most? I mean, he just had this very profound game of chess going on in his head with the Taliban. He was outnumbered three to one, and they could not. And he was convinced he was like we're going to get those fuckers eventually you know and um and he was also um very willing to take risks so at one point they were going to assault there were taliban dug in taliban positions dug into this you know, along this ridge line and from that ridge the taliban could shell the only supply route 
out of Masood's area to Tajikistan and winter was coming on and the, he had to dislodge those gun emplacements from that ridge and it was you know, they were entrenched ridge top positions right and held by Taliban and Pakistani intelligence and Al Qaeda like it was a very very serious place and he knew he could dislodge them but but he had to figure out where the minefields were because that you know if you attack through a minefield you lose half your men right and so he went forward with a couple of guys beyond the you know into no man's land and crept up close to the Taliban positions to try to figure out where the minefields were so they wouldn't attack through them and when he was out there they started shooting at him I mean bullets were going you know popping all around him and this is the supreme commander of those forces and of that society and he was out there with two men crawling around in no man's land with a pair of binoculars trying to figure out like where do we go so we don't lose too many guys that's a leader wow yeah i mean how could anyone see that and say you know he wouldn't he would do what i he yeah. i would he wouldn't do anything i wouldn't do does that make sense like yeah. it, like he would not ask me to do anything he wouldn't do exactly if he's out there on the front lines crawling right. through you know bushes and, and right. dirt getting shot at this is a guy that'll ride for everyone else in there and he would do any job. I, my, my book, Freedom, I, I look at how underdog groups can defeat a larger, a, a, a more powerful adversary, right? And um, from MMA fighting where there's a, a mis mismatch in the weight classes all the way on up through wars and um, the um, labor movement in this country, you know, 100 years ago where that deck was completely stacked against the labor, you know, the, the labor advocates, and yet they won, right? And uh, so what, the, what I found is that the successful underdog groups invariably had three things in common. Um, they had leadership that was willing to die for the cause, right? They had a transcendent cause, and in, in, in other words, a cause that had to do with like freedom and human dignity, right? They couldn't just want this piece of land, right? They, the, the, for an underdog group to win, it has to be fighting for a, uh, in a kind of existential fight for its own dignity, its own freedom. Uh, the Easter Rising in Ireland, for example, in 1916. Um, the Montenegrins fighting the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s. I mean, the, the Ottomans kept invading Montenegro and outnumbered the Montenegrins by as much as 12 to 1. And the Montenegrins just kept winning, right? And that's a transcendent cause. And, um, and finally, the deep involvement of women in the movement. And, um, you know, you see all three of those things in Ukraine, for example. Um, and uh, there are, you know, there are... Um, um, Muslim societies where the role of women is extremely constrained, right? And so that's not even really on the menu. But in Western societies where women have, a, um, you know, access to those kinds of roles, if you're not involving women, you're probably not going to do that well. Wow. And is that involving women specifically on the battlefield or just in any capacity? No, in every capacity, right? I mean, a monkey can fire a machine gun, right? You don't, it's not, it's not you know, we, you know, the women are actually very, more valuable in some ways in other <clears throat> In other capacities, um, they in the during the labor movement in America in 1912, there was there were textile mill strikes in Massachusetts. I mean, horribly abusive conditions. You know, a terrible mortality rate in the factories from accidents, um, child labor, all this horrible stuff, right? And a very low wage, right? And um, so they they struck the factory workers struck. And they were, you know, they had the National Guard out there with fixed bayonets and it was very violent and people were getting killed and the strikes were going nowhere until the strikers put women on the front line. And then women, women, you know, impart a kind of moral authority. You know, I mean, a bunch of guys in the street is just a rabble, right? <laughs> Once you put women on the street, it, it, they impart a kind of moral authority and even the most abusive leaders are a little more reluctant to kill women in public. Wow. Right. Not that it doesn't happen. Sure. It's a little more reluctant. The optics are just so horrible. Right. And so <laughs> this one cop, um, so they would, so the women by the strikers, they were used as sort of intelligence and they would like, like quote, cozy up to some of the National Guard soldiers and get intelligence from them. And 
they had um, women, men are very good in hierarchies, right? So if you're going to get people to charge machine guns, you sort of need a hierarchy with the leader on top saying, this is happening, go, right? Women tend away from hierarchies in female groups and towards sort of lateral, egalitarian, lateral communication, which isn't superior or inferior to what men do, right? But they're, they're, both, they're both very powerful in their own way and they're both needed. And the thing about a lateral network, it's, it's impossible to penetrate. You can't decapitate it. So the authorities in Massachusetts, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, could not get inside the female information network, lateral information network, that was part of the, the movement. And they were also, the women also wound up on the sort of front lines of the strikes. And this one, this one cop said, he said, one good cop can handle 10 men, but it takes 10 cops to handle one woman. And when they started putting women deeply involved into the protests on the streets and in the organizational efforts, the strikers eventually won. Interesting. Wow, I've never heard that before. Yeah. That is very interesting. And, and you can find that across, you know, all different underdog groups throughout, you know, Yeah, I mean, there's history. always exceptions, but yeah, I sure. mean, there's one of these, these are the sort of common themes in the groups. You're like, they're not gonna win. And they, oh, wow, they did, wow. right? And, you know, you know, sometimes the, the, what the women are doing are, are sustaining the society while the men fight, right? The, 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 of course, right? I mean, you need to keep things going. And so in Montenegro, I mean, I'm sure there was a few women who fought, but for mostly they were keeping the society going because otherwise there's nothing to fight for. And you, just, you, can't, ha you, know, you can't just have one, right? You need, you need both. And if the women are not buying into what you're doing, it's not going to work. Interesting. Yeah, and I guess the woman thing is, I've never heard that before. And the first two things make a lot of sense. Like having a leader that'll die and having a cause worth fighting for, it makes a lot of sense for why martyrs are so important and yeah. so powerful. Because yeah. they kind of encapsulate both. Yeah. Like if you have a leader that dies, that proves that the cause is worth fighting for. So it, right. it, it satisfies the cause, but it also it proves that the leaders were willing to die. And that probably right. emboldens the next leader that's gonna fill that space. That makes a lot of sense. I've always seen martyrs throughout history. You know, I grew up Catholic, so obviously the idea of martyrdom is like very important to, right. to Catholic tradition. And it always struck me that it was like so powerful. Right. And I guess it always comes back to that same theme of self-sacrifice. This cause is worth dying for. This person died for it, and right. they were a leader that was willing to die, even though they didn't necessarily have yeah, to. Yeah, you never want you never want to feel like you're, you're getting conned by the leaders. Like we're all in this together, charge, and then you find out. Yeah. I mean, look what look what's happening with January six, right? Right. Like all those idiots that went into the Capitol, like they thought they, you know, that Donald Trump was like lockstep with them, but it turns out. You know, push comes to shove, the indictments start coming down. He's like, no, I had nothing to do with that. Right. I didn't tell him to go. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want anything. Right. Yeah. How betrayed would you feel? Right. Right. So people, you know, they, they're always on guard against getting screwed like that. And um, if you have leaders, I don't, I don't think Trump would take a bullet for this country. I don't think he'd take a bullet for Melania. Right. And uh, um <laughs> I don't, and I don't think Bill Clinton would have either. By the way, I'm a Democrat, but I, right. I also don't think Bill Clinton would have, right? Right. But, um, you know, I think, uh, I think when you have a leader that's clearly willing to die, you know for a fact you're not being duped. You're not being um, conned. Um, Zelensky was offered a you know helicopter flight out of Ukraine right before the invasion. You know, I think by the CIA, they're like, listen, you had to get out of there. Like, they're going to kill you as soon as they catch you. And Zelensky said, no, my my place is here. That's a leader who's willing to die. Do you think Vladimir Putin would risk his life for any of this? Of course not. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm. I guess even when I look at American politics, I'm like, I don't know if, if there was a president in the last you know 50 years that would risk their life in that way yeah and they shouldn't have to because the the, the you know like we don't what you don't want is the commander-in-chief taking a bullet right right so so but you, i think you can get a sort of sense of if they're running for president for their own personal benefit or do they do or do they believe that they that they have a vision that will the up, that will lift up all you know like a lot of people in this country that will serve humanity well in this country well i mean i think you can sort of tell the difference and I didn't vote for George Bush, but I think he had some, you know, he was a Christian and I'm an atheist. So I'm, you have to understand how, you know, where I'm coming from when I say this, but he was a Christian. He had a, um, he had a, an ideal of, um, 
of what did he call it? Compassionate conservatism. Mm -hmm. That was very focused on the poor, lifting the poor up economically. Um, I think he really believed, you know, I think he believed that under his stewardship, America would get better. I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think um, Trump really did. Like, I mean, I, I feel like Trump ran, and I understand why people voted for him. I actually do. And I think he's a great performer, but I don't think he really gave, gives a shit about this country, particularly, right? Like, it's hard to tell if he does or, I, I think it's completely performative. And that's a necessary requirement to be a good leader. Well, not even, I mean, there, it, to be a leader. Yeah. Right? To be a leader, you have to put the people you're leading, put their interests ahead of your own. Otherwise, you're just not a leader, right? Yeah. You said it great the, 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 in a different interview I listened to where you said it's not like there's good leadership and bad leadership. Right. It would be like saying if there's good honesty and bad honesty. Right, exactly. You know, it's like yeah. you can't have bad honesty. It's either honest or it's not. That's right. Yeah. Otherwise, we, you're, 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 you know, you're not a leader. You're a manager. Hmm. Right. You're an operator. That's an interesting distinction. Right. And I think Trump's a great operator. Like he's a genius operator. Yeah, I'd agree with that. In terms of leadership, yeah, I don't know if you, I guess, in, yeah, I guess people would just look at anyone that has followers and say, oh, that's a good leader. Whether or not they're writing for the right cause or not, you know, a cult leader, you know, someone that's like running some type of, uh, you know, Ponzi scheme or something and has all these people bought in, well, like maybe they're a good leader, I guess is what people would think. But I guess your distinction would say- They're, they're good manipulators. They're operators. Yeah, operators, the manipulators, yeah. And, and some of them are brilliant at it. Right. But if you're not, you know, if you're not willing to at least run the same risks as everyone else, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not saying you have to take the first bullet, right. But at least run the same risks as every, uh, of everyone else. You're not being a leader in a, in a very ancient human sense of the word. There was, um, when I was with American soldiers in Afghanistan, we were on a, we were in a, very, in a quite a bad situation up on this ridge line. Everyone was out of water. It was very hot. Um, people were starting to, I mean, it was bad and we were surrounded. I mean, there was like Taliban on either side and there was sort of nowhere to hide and they're about to open up on us, right? And they could hear it on the ICOM chat, the radio chatter from the Taliban. You know, basically you're like, we've got them cornered. There's nowhere for them to hide. They were shooting from, a, they would be shooting from both directions from a few hundred meters away. And we, it, like, it was very, so it was very, very unsettling. And so... Uh, Lieutenant Piosa sort of stood up because he had to see where the heavy weapons were, like where the, you know, 240s were and the saws, like, so he stood up to look around and we were all sort of waiting for like this, like tornado of gunfire to hit us. And he stood up to see where all his, the, the fire teams were. And um, everyone was taking cover. We were way, way down behind anything we could find. And, um, and Sergeant Rice said, sir, please take cover. Your job is to lead the men. My job is to get shot at. Please take cover. Wow. Whatever you need, whatever you need to know, I'll find it out. And so that's leadership on Piosa's part, right? Like, and, and, um, like if you were a brave leader, your own men will say, sir, can you please take cover? We need you, right? You can't get yourself shot right now. Yeah. The, in, in the Easter Rising in Dublin in, in 1916, um, uh, the sort of the, the leader of the, in, in, Dub, in, in Dublin, this sort of military leader of the insurrectionists, I can't remember his name, um, was so brave that his own aides were like kept, trying to drag him out of like the line of fire from the British, from the Br British soldiers. And he got shot twice in a week, right? Wow. And they were like, sir, you got to, you can't get yourself killed. We need you. Like that's leadership. Wow. Do you think it has to be pursuing a moral good to be considered a good leader or to be considered a leader? No, I think you just have to, I mean, look, the hell's angels have leaders, right? And I think those, and the, I mean, whatever, there's a <laughs> It's a lot of problems with those guys, moral problems with the Hells Angels, right? They're murderers and they're criminals and, you know, whatever. But I'm guessing that their leaders are pretty brave. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the same tenets. It could be applied for good or evil. Yeah. But it just has to be self-sacrifice. That's right. Wow. Yeah, that is... I'm curious in your own personal life, since you've had children, has your idea of leadership within the family changed, like on a very, like, micro level? Do you find that you are... 
uh, applying rules and th lessons that you've learned in the battlefield into your own personal life? It's not really leadership in a family. It's parenting. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, I mean, parenting is so crazy and, and you, there's no way to be prepared for it. And it's such a, um, we live in a very small apartment. We all, you know, sleep in a group together on the floor, on a pad on the floor. And, you know, it's like we're camping. It's like we're backpacking, except we live in an apartment. Like we live in a very small space. And, you know, children, they're, emotional needs and their physical needs are, you know, changed by the month, by the year. And so you're constantly trying to, you know, sort of adapting and, 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 and reinventing the wheel, trying to figure out what, how to give them what they need while also maintaining a kind of functionality in your life so that you can work and, you know, like have a life. And, and, uh, but it, it, it's not leadership in the sense that a lieutenant in a platoon is a leader, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just a different thing that the, the, the um, your children are completely your responsibility and they, they don't really get a vote, right? Like, and, and they're not old enough to be able to get a vote. They just don't know yet, mm -hmm. right? So it's a different, it really is a different thing. But, um, but when you get groups of adults together having to do something, then there is then there is a question of leadership. Hmm. And sometimes it'll arise spontaneously. There was, I, I know someone who lived on the, who lives in Mississippi and was there during Hurricane Katrina, which wiped out, you know, a lot of the Gulf Coast in, you know, a matter of hours. And um, there were a lot of, there were a lot of desperate people afterwards. And, um, and so this one woman who was a waitress in a diner she didn't even own the place, right? She was a waitress in the diner. And she realized there was no power, so a lot of food was going to go bad. So she started, with permission from the owner, she just started cooking all the perishable food. And people started going to the diner to, to be fed. So she turned this thing that was like the food was rotting. She turned it into, so pretty soon she was like running emergency operations for the county, right? Because she was just, you know, a natural, natural leader. Wow. And um, clearly not thinking about herself, right? She was, and and uh, and so people will spontaneously like rise up and fill that role. Men and women both, like right. they're but both, you know, either way. Leaders can come from anywhere. Yeah. A yeah. Quick thing, I was curious about why do you guys sleep on the floor? Well, you know, because we co-sleep and we didn't want them falling out of bed. Oh, really? So you got rid of like the bed frame. So it's just like a mattress on the floor? Well, it's a pad. It's not a mattress. It's a pad. It's a pad. What kind of pad? Um, I don't know. It's like eight inches of foam. Oh, co really? Covered in a, yeah. It's just on the ground? Yeah. Is that comfortable? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, not, uh, I mean you go, you've gone camping, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah it's, we're camping. Every day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would, right. And we live in a tiny apartment, so there is sort of, is, it's not like the girls can have their own room or something. Like, there is no other room, basically. So, so yeah, we just sleep together. Was this, did you pick this up from, like, uh, like advice from someone? Or is this, like, well, a, a tradition somewhere that you saw? I don't know how it started, but if you think about it, like, human, I mean, as I said, as I've said before, like, Americans are the only mammal that doesn't sleep with its young. Mm -hmm. Like, every other mammal, and, 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 societies all around the world and for all of human history people sleep together because it's safer right and so particularly young children they get their you know infants and young in, in babies and young children get their sense of safety from proximity to adults mm -hmm. right so if you take a three months old month old and put it in a room by a dark room by itself it knows it's not safe right that's why they cry Right. So when the, the, the way babies like calm themselves down and know they're safe is they can smell you, they can feel you, they can hear you. And so that, I mean, that's how humans have done it for hundreds of thousands of years. And you know what? Even a modern American family, if they went backpacking in like Bob Marshall wilderness in Montana, I'll tell you what, they wouldn't have a separate tent for the babies. Right. Like they would, they would all sleep together. This is so interesting. Right. So See, why, so why would you not do that at home? Because this all makes sense, but and I know people talk about it, but I don't. I rarely meet people that actually do it. Oh, it's lovely, and the, the kids. I mean, you get so much sleep, right? Because the kid, you know, if the kid wakes up in another room, you have to get up. If the baby wakes up in another room, you have to get up and whatever. Right. If you're all sleeping together, even if the baby wakes up, you know, they they nurse back to sleep or what have you. It's all sort of taking. And there's all taking place. I mean. It's all taking place in one one place. I've also read that sleeping on the floor specifically is actually very beneficial. Like there's a lot of like health benefits. Have you heard this? No. 
So. It's so funny that you're doing the thing yeah. that people recommend. This I, I forget who wrote, I think it was the guy that wrote uh, Blue Zone about uh, you know the different places on yeah. Earth where people live to you know that exceed the the window. Right. Um, and one of the things that he pointed out is that in many of these blue zones, people sleep on the floor up until old age. Right. And so as a result, they're constantly getting up and oh, getting, getting down. Right, right. And they have like constant mobility up until like their 90s. Whereas like in America and a lot of the West, people just kind of like roll into this foamy platform. Right. And, and they roll, roll out of right. it. Yeah. And they never bend down. They never touch the floor. Right. And then the idea of falling down, they can't get back up because they never get up. Right. Oh, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. And if you're sleeping on the floor, you're probably sleeping on the floor with at least one other couple yeah. other people. Right. I mean, and your children. I mean, it's just it's how the Afghans do it. It's how it's done in Africa. It's, it's, done, it's still done in Japan. I mean, people sleep in family groups in Japan, which is a you know a sort of modernized. When when you country. saw these things, did that enable a little bit of your personal desire to do them? Like, did it normalize it a little? Where you're like, wait, most of the world is doing things this way. I don't know if I thought about it that consciously, and I don't know where the idea came from. There's a great website called Evolutionary Parenting about how to parent in an evolutionary consistent way in modern society. And, okay. uh, and yeah, so it's a um, wonderful website. We know, Tra we know the woman, Tracy, who runs it. And, um, uh, and you, know, all, you know, I was an anthropologist in college, and I see things that way. And, you know, the other thing, we, we never had a baby carriage, right? Like humans just carried their children, right? Or put them in a sling. And, you know, infants really like to hear your heartbeat, to feel you. And infants don't weigh anything. They weigh, what, five pounds, 10 yeah. pounds, 15 pounds? Like, yeah, you can carry and, a backpack around all day. Well, yeah. exactly, <laughs> right? And so so we never, had a, we never had a stroller. And I'm, you know, I get it. If you're a sort of overwhelmed parent and you got triplets and you're, you know, whatever, you need some mechanical advantage. I totally get it, right? But as it, you know, we weren't in that situation. And so I would have like, the, the, our, when the girls were younger, I would have Aisha, Aisha my, my eldest daughter, on on, um, on my shoulders and uh, um, the little one on my chest. And, you know, that was, you know, 60, 60 pounds of baby, right? But that's fine. I've, yeah. I've carried 60 pounds before. You've been with guys carrying 100 pounds yeah. of ammo. Yeah, no problem, right? So, and they would walk all over New York like that. And, you know, eventually, you know, like I saw a photograph of a group in the Amazon jungle, a, a native group, and they were on the move, right? And uh, <clears throat> they're on this jungle trail, and the women, the men were carrying the weapons and some gear, and the women were carrying the babies and some gear. And everyone from like age five up was walking, four up was walking, right? And, 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 and the five-year-olds were carrying gear, right? So, you know, clearly we're um, adapted to have children walking like pretty early. Mm -hmm. Can they walk as far and as fast as adults? No, of course not, but they can walk. And that, I certainly found that with my girls. Like they were, you know, the, they were walking really, really early around the city. You know, right. they get tired. I'd lift them up, put them on my shoulder, you know, whatever, but that's the human norm. Wow. And what other things do you do, either parenting or just within your personal life that you feel like is atypical, but fits this more evolutionary anthropological mold? I mean, obviously not having a smartphone is a... Yeah, I don't have a smartphone, right? I just, like... I'm you never not, had one? No, I never had one. It didn't interest you? It horrified me. Like, I just, like, who... I just didn't want to be that distracted. Like, just pummeled by email and like, distractions and time sucks. And, like, I, I mean, it just... It, it's it, The battery dies, <laughs> like... The, the, the battery dies in hours. It's huge. Like, I, I mean, there's so many disadvantages to the smartphone, right? So, I mean, this thing, I, if I, I can go on a three-day trip and not bring my charger because the battery lasts so long, wow. right? I mean, it's it's tiny. I, I, I can't get email on it, which is such a blessing. I mean, email is a weird thing, right? Like, in most, for most, almost all work, the more you do of the work you have to do, the less there is left to do. The more email you do, the more you create. Right? So the more often you do your email and the more diligent you are in returning email, the more, actually the more work you're creating for yourself rather than less. It's the only thing I can think of that's like that. It's like the Greek myth, myth of Sisyphus. Yeah, literally. The more you push it, the more you have to push it and you got to right. push it all the way. And you're, and you're in this cycle and you're, you know, you're part of a system where you're making immensely powerful, wealthy people even more powerful and wealthy, right? They're trading your time, your peace of mind, your concentration for their gain, right? That's all it is. Mm -hmm. 
right? And you, and you, it, um, the things that smartphones, I mean, I get it. There's a camera, you can, you can, there's a restaurant app, whatever. I mean, I get it. It's convenient. But the idea that convenience is an unexamined good, like that's, uh, that, I find that really dangerous. Convenience is great, but it's just convenience. It's not necessarily good. Just because it's convenient does right. not mean that it's good for me or that it's good for exactly. people. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, I have a I have a glove compartment full of maps, and I know how to tell direction from the sky, and I, I know how to flag down a taxi, and if I I know how to find a restaurant by walking around. Yeah. Sorry, like, or I can ask directions. I can actually go up, go up to someone and say, "Hey, I'm trying. I'm looking for a bub. Is there a diner around here?" Right. So you end up engaging in the world in these really wonderful ways, and you're protected from this this onslaught of like digital servitude that people live under when they have a smartphone and they just, oh, look, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an addict like everybody else, right? Like if I had a smartphone, I'd be on that thing all constantly. I know myself, right. right? Like if I had a pack of cigarettes in my pocket, I would smoke them, right? right. So that's why I don't walk around with cigarettes. Right. You don't have a smartphone because you're better than other people. You have it, be you don't have it because you're just as shitty uh, as everyone. Exactly. <laughs> and they just don't, they look miserable. People look miserable on them. They look obsessive and anxious and completely out to lunch, right? They're just not in the world. This is it. This is all you get. This world right now, the life you're living, it's all you get. And if you really want to spend it inside something, look, if you replace the smartphone with any other thing, like a book or a chess game or a rock or anything, and have people walking around staring at their object as much as they stare at their smartphones, you'd be like, that dude walking around looking at the rock, he's insane. He's out of his mind. Yeah. He's out of his mind. Right? So that woman walking around staring, staring at her wedding ring, completely nuts. Yeah. Right? Arrogant. Narcissist. Yeah, Total just. narcissist or anxious or whatever, <laughs> like whatever it is. So so that's what I see when I see people walking around with that thing. Hmm. I wrote an essay for National Review. I mean, I'm a Democrat, I'm a liberal, and that's a conservative publication. But they, they'll actually will publish things that like my usual outlets won't won't touch. And um, uh, I wrote an essay called The Anthropology. Anthropology of Manhood for National Review that the Times commissioned and then said we can't run, we can't publish this it's too bi it, it it involves biology you can't talk about biology why it's the uh, the mores of the uh, you know at the New York it was Times a thing they didn't want to get into yeah it's too deterministic <laughs> right so anyway with the Times is an amazing newspaper I don't mean to slag on them so but so it went to the National Review who are not scared of science. Right now, it's the right wing that's not scared of science. The left wing is. It's a very bizarre, bizarre change in within my lifetime. But um, so I wrote I wrote this essay for that that, uh, that they published about freedom. Like we live in a society where our individual rights are protected by the law, imperfectly, you know, imperfectly carried out, but still pr protected by the law. Everyone gets a vote uh, if should they want one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no arbitrary confinement, um, maybe as corpus and all that stuff, a, an essentially free society with flaws, right? So in a free society like this, what is the primary threat to your freedom? If it's not the state, if it's not an enemy that's going to invade you and kill you, and it's not the state itself which will um, oppress you, what is the primary threat to freedom in this country? And I th you know, thought long and hard about it. I was like, it's addiction, right? It's the, it's the, the, the threat to freedom is actually in, in this country, because we live in a largely free society, is basically internal, right? So we're addicted to media entertainment, television. We're addicted to social media. Uh, a lot of people are addicted to alcohol and drugs. They're addicted to sugar. They're addicted to uh, buying a lot of shit online that they can't pay for. They're addicted to debt. Like they're addicted. And, and all of these things are people enacting their free will, so in a sense they're free, but they wind up in a state of a, a kind of servitude, right? Because they're, if, you're, if you're psychologically or chemically dependent on something, you actually do not have your full f f uh, range of choices available to you. And one of the, you know, with the pervasive addiction in the society across income levels and everything else and ages is social media. Smartphone, right? And the, the, you know, the data coming in on the effect, particularly on young people and particularly young women, of smartphones and social media are absolutely devastating. Yeah. And, I, um, and so I, uh, 
I, I, I had the chance to interview a man who had done 20 some years in prison for murder. He was from, from a very, very poor part of Brooklyn. And, you know, he killed somebody and he went to jail for it and he knew that he, whatever, he, he knew that he had done wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And he reformed himself he in prison. He served his time. He served his time, became an incredibly brilliant, smart guy. Got, you know, found God, found education, found books, found enlightenment in prison, amazing, amazing man. And I interviewed him, you know, like two weeks after he was released, right? And, and I said, um, <laughs> I said, I feel a little silly asking this, but is it possible to be more free in prison than outside of prison? Right. And he laughed. He said, of course it is. Are you kidding? He said, in prison, it's very hard to get drugs. It's very hard to be an addict. Um, there are no distractions. There's no smartphones. There's like no social media. There's none of that shit. And there's nothing but time. And with all that time, eventually you're going to have an honest conversation with yourself about who you really are and what you're doing in there. And then you're a free man. And he said a lot of people on the outside never even have that conversation with themselves and they're not free. Wow. Yeah. They're caught up in the constant yeah. sort of cycle, whatever their thing is. It's, you know, sports and then social media and then party. Yeah. And, and it's under the illusion of freedom. Yeah, but it's not. It ends up being not free. You're, 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 um, you're, you're, you're following a pattern, a daily pattern of a sort of obsessive, anxious interest in these things that actually don't really mean that much, and um, and then boom, your life's gone by. Yeah, and that's not a free state. There's a lot of people listening to this that are like, "Wow, I wish I could do that." There's so many people that have like this loathsome like relationship with their phones and with social media where they're like, I want to get away, but I need it for my work, yada, yada. I mean, there are people, you know, I get it. Like there are jobs where you actually need a smartphone because you have a boss and you have, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I, you know, I work for myself, so, you know, it's a little easier for me, but there's also a lot of jobs where you don't need it. Right. And, and the, so with the exception of the people that actually truly need phones for work, like, uh, um, my heart goes out to them, right? But everyone else, and there's a fair number of people, and certainly teenagers, do not need them and uh, would be better off without them. And I think, I mean, I know I have a friend who has a teenage son. The, the kid said, you know, we would, if we could all get rid of our smartphones all at once, we would all do it. The problem is if we get rid of them individually, we're left out. Yeah. So even, even they even know, the young people even know it's not good for them. And, um, but what I say to people is, look, if you want to be free of, that addiction, that waste of life, like it's pretty easy. You, you like take your phone and you like wrap your finger around one edge of it and you walk down to a local pond and you see how many skips you can get out of it before it sinks to the bottom. It's just a rock. Yeah. Something that I did that gave me a little bit of distance, that, again, this is sort of the coward's way to do it, what I yeah. did, but I, uh, I got an Apple watch. And so this, it seems counterintuitive. You're like, yeah. oh, you have this technology with you all the time. But I was able to leave the house and leave my phone at home. And right. I wasn't able to do like social media or anything. So I could get calls and texts on it. Right. And so I could walk around with that. And if I needed to, I guess I could like use the map kind of. Like it has very limited features. Well, the great thing about a flip phone is that it's calls and texts. Yeah. That's it. It's the same thing. So I was able to walk around and yeah. kind of leave it and be detached a little and be yeah. like, if I have to get an Uber home, I can call a taxi. We right. can find a restaurant here and kind of live. But I've never lived in that world. Right. You spent uh, many years in a pre-internet, pre-phone world. Yeah. I had no experience in it. Right. I, like right. I had the access, I had the ability, I guess, to get an iPhone by middle school. I didn't get one until late high school, but I don't even know what that world is like. And so the idea of going to something that I have no familiarity with, even if I know intellectually it's probably better for me and probably will make right, me right, happier, right. is a is a tough bargain. Right. It's a it's a hard wager to yeah. deal with. But I I know inherently I'm like Ugh, this would make me happier. Yeah. Starting the day looking at. I dog mean, they've, listen, they've done they've done tests, right? They've had people control groups and then test groups where they just uh, took social media away for a couple of weeks and even. Even within a couple of weeks, mental health improved in the test group that had no social media. Yeah. In two weeks. Yeah. Right? I've read some of Jonathan Haidt's research on it, specifically with women. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah. you know, pointing at like young girls using social media are getting a litany of mental disorders. Oh God, know, it's the, brutal. The eating the disorders. This, this, yeah. The suicide and depression rate is terrifying. It's, I believe it's gone, for teenage girls, it's gone up it, three times as fast as it has for boys. Yeah. Something like that. And it started with the advent of the smartphone, right? In not social media, which, I mean, look, I have Facebook. It's on my laptop. If I'm at my desk, I, can, I don't post anything ever, but it's kind of interesting way of sort of seeing the world a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, but once you have that stuff on your phone and it's in your pocket all the time, then you always have access to it. And then you're never, you're never, boredom is good, right? Like, Periods of boredom are good because your mind sort of wanders and it can be quite a rich, uh, intell in, intellectually, like like strategic boredom can be sort of intellectually quite, ri yeah. quite rich. I've and, heard this. Oh, sorry. Can yeah. You... No. And, so, and, you know, with the phone, it's like the first thing people do when they're waiting for the bus is pull out their phone. The first thing, I mean, it's horrible. So they ne their mind is never in idle. Yeah. I think about this as a comic. Like there's all these times where I could be like, I, I, everyone always tells me like, oh, I have the best ideas in the shower. I'm yeah, like, exactly. Is it yeah. because the shower is because yeah. right. you're, you're not doing it. It's because you're, you know, your phone's not there. So you're yeah. forced to think and all of a sudden right. you're like, oh, I still have this great joke. Right. And I just talk to all these comedians that are like, yeah, I can't think of anything. I'm like, are, is there ever like idleness? And I like, I even stopped listening to music. I'm right. one of these people that like would listen to music perpetually. I wake up music first right. thing in the morning in the shower, listen to music, listen to music on the bike to work, right. go to work, do the pod, come yep. home, listen, constant music. I, I got my Spotify, uh, Spotify, you're familiar with Spotify, yeah. right? I mean, at this point I'm going to treat you like a caveman. I'm like, you've heard of Spotify. <laughs> uh, Spotify literally will give you data at the end of the year and say, oh, you're in X percentile of users. Right. And I was in like the 0.01% of listeners. Wow. I was listening more, almost more than anyone. And then I was like, oh, I need to stop. I need to spend yeah. time not consuming things. And also understand if you don't want to be you, like most healthy people, I think, do not want to, do not want to be manipulated. Right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you want to be manipulation free so you're making your own decisions. So what the social media companies did, Instagram was particularly bad with this, is that they figured out that if they withheld likes, I, re I read about this in the New Yorker or something, so this isn't my research, right? That I'm just passing this along. Instagram figured out that if they, uh, if it withheld likes, people would get very anxious. They'd post something and they wouldn't get any likes and they'd get more and more anxious so they would check obsessively and then eventually Instagram would release all the likes all at once and they get this sort of endorphin hit. But in the meantime, they'd been obsessively checking that shit for hours, right? The cortisol levels rise, stress levels rise, right? And But every time they go back on the site, they're being bombarded with all the other stuff that monetizes this whole thing because of the advertisements, advertisements or whatever else, right? So it's the way, it's the way that they figured out that there's an algorithm that will keep people obsessively checking it's by withholding approval. Wow. So that's not something that like a 15 year old girl needs. You know what I mean? Like that's a terrible thing to do to a young person, yeah. right? And so you are, we are being manipulated by those people and they are making amounts of money that are sort of unprecedented in human history, right? I mean, is it Google, Facebook? I can't, one of those monsters. If it were a country, it would be the 19th largest economy in the world. In GDP. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so mean, just it's... like they are trading our lives and our peace of mind and in some cases our health. People, the suicide rate has gone up, right? So like there's actual, there are actual casualties now in this. They are trading all of that for their power and money. So if you're anti-corporate, if you're anti-abusive power, like you can't, you, you can't use a smartphone. Like don't be an addict in, don't, don't make them wealthier with your addiction. Like that's the, that to me, that's the ultimate, like, like, why would you do that? Yeah. I mean, I think they'll make it, I think they'll pass legislation on it at some point. Yeah. Like I've heard people make the comparison. I, I forget which comedian had this joke. It might've been Ryan Hamilton, where he had a joke where he's like, people will treat social media the way we treated cigarettes. 
where we'd look back and be like, they let kids use it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Your doctor would use it? Exactly. Your doctor would be telling you medical advice while smoking a cigarette? Yeah. While going on Instagram? Right. I mean, like it would they, be seen the same way. They had ashtrays in elevators. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> right. It, 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 like, yeah. And people would be like, wait, you could use social media on an airplane? Yeah. That's crazy. Right. <laughs> yeah, young children, right? I mean, you see two-year-olds on iPads, you know, like, I mean, our, our girls, six and three, they have no... Um, Virtually no screen time and, and no interactive screen time, right? I mean, they get some child programming. We don't have a television, mm -hmm. right? But they're not allowed to use an iPhone or an iPad um, uh, that's sort of interactive because that's the part that's 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 addictive. Get that dopamine. Right. So they, you know, they get a little bit of child programming on the laptop after dinner is like some of these PBS like cartoons. Or yeah, right. Yeah. Right. But no interactive, like touch screen, none of that stuff. Wow. And have you... Have you looked in the idea of having less toys? Have you heard of this? Yep. This is something my wife has brought up. My, my wife, weirdly, I mean, we're kind of on this mindset. It's just hard to do with where we're at. But, like, she's a midwife. She only does, like, home births. and Wow. Yeah. So she's, like. That's an intense job. Bro, it's insane. And yeah. I, have, I have no right to complain. Like, I'll, she'll, I'll come home and I'll be like, <laughs> podcast wasn't that good. I don't know. Right. And then she'll be like, oh, well. I'm covered in blood and there's this yeah. cleaning vomit up and this mom almost died. Like, it's, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. They're, they're, they're warriors. And then I she mean, comes home and makes yeah. me food. I'm like, yeah. what is happening? This is yeah. crazy. But she was even explaining the idea of uh, having less toys for children. Yeah. And she's like, when you give children more choice and more toys, they become overstimulated and they become more bored. Mm -hmm. That they're using their toys in less creative ways. And as a result... They are seeking. They're they're actually less satisfied with more toys. Whereas if you have yeah fewer toys, less uh, fancy, less bright colors, less deliberate. So like things like blocks, Legos, things like that that are right. more free form. Right. That would force children in the idleness to become more creative. That's right. And more satisfied. Right. It's, because ultimately, it's the effort and the purpose and trying to overcome yeah. their boredom and, that makes them satisfied. And the sort of creative. Like the imagined, imagine the imagination. They have to engage their imagination, right? So, if you can figure out how to make a a doll out of a stick, you've engaged your imagination, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, one of the guys in the platoon that I was with, he he was raised by what he called hippies, like super <laughs> pacifist, like Northwest Coast. Parents, really lovely people. I feel like you pointed at me when you said that. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> right. you kind of just like, yeah, right. hit me. All right. <laughs> and he wasn't allowed. He and his brother weren't allowed to to play. They didn't no no toy guns. Hmm. Right. Oh, I remember this in in Restrepo. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So his mother, I met his mother. His mother said that she caught um, she caught one of the boys. He had he had taken bites out of a piece of toast, so that it was in the shape of a pistol. And then he shot his brother with it. <laughs> it says a lot about boys, but also, you know, there's a there's a creative act there, which is great for the brain, mm -hmm. as opposed to picking up the like replica plastic pistol child, you know, like right. and where there's no, I mean, that's that's cool too, right? But it, there it isn't quite that creative act. Yeah, I mean, that part of the documentary. So the way you guys edit it is so great, yeah. where he's like, yeah, you know, we weren't allowed to play with guns while he's shooting. <laughs> blam, 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 yeah, blam, yeah. I mean, it's just it's so yeah. good. But I, I'm curious, like, how do you deal with resistance, though, right? Like, with your children, I presume you won't be giving them iPhones when they turn 15, and you won't be encouraging them to get social media when they get to high school or whatever else. How do you curb that rebellion that is innate to humans? <clears throat> children accept a lot. I mean, they can normalize almost anything, including extremely painful, toxic situations. And so, <clears throat> so... You know, they just know, they're just like okay. So this, we're, you know, we live in a family where there's no, no iPads, no iPhones. Mm -hmm. My wife has an iPhone, but she, you know, she treats it like, like the toaster or something. I want a piece of toast. I'll go to I'll, yeah. it's on the shelf. I'll go make a piece of toast with the toaster. I think it's hard for one person to be on the iPhone when one person isn't. You know what right. I mean? Like if my wife is sitting there at dinner and listen, looking at me. I'm not going to pull my phone. Yeah, out. exactly. You know right. what I mean? It's but like it, it's like smoking, right? Like, right. It's like I mean, it's it, if two, <laughs> literally if two yeah. people smoke, it's really easy to smoke. But if she's taking a peek at it, I'll look. Yeah. I'll kind of, you know what <clears> I mean? Yeah. And so I guess it's she's much less likely to use social media in her phone when you're, right. you know, you got this brick. Well, my <laughs> yeah, my wife just like leaves it on a shelf. Like right. she doesn't. It's not on her person. Mm -hmm. She'll leave the apartment without it, right? I mean, she just like forgets. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so the girl, the girls are very accepting of it. And, you know, at some point, I'm sure there'll be a rebel, there'll be a rebellion and uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, a coup d'état. You know, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. 
and you know we'll deal with it when it happens. But uh, you know, just you know, I, I read an interesting article about this, like with addiction, and it is a form of addiction. The later the person is exposed to the addictive uh, substance, be it alcohol, or drugs, um, social media, the later they're exposed to it, the more the, the the greater the chance that they won't become addicted. So if you just hold it off as long as are you going to hold you know. Are you going to hold it off indefinitely? No. Eventually, you know, our girls are going to try alcohol. They're going to try smoking. They're going to try everything, hopefully, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, the, just not now, right? And right. This, it's the same thing with social media. If you can hold this off until their their brains are, you know, they're more formed, they're just, they'll, they have a greater chance of not be becoming addicts of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I guess I look at me, like, I didn't have a lot of sugar growing up. Like, my parents didn't really have sugar around the house. And right. to this day... I'm so addicted to sugar. And obviously, it's a very addictive chemical, it's right? Super like, addictive. It's super yeah. addictive, They put it in cigarettes. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. there's all these books of, like, right. you know, sugar. It's is, everywhere, it's yeah. It's insane. And the sugar lobby has so much power. It's crazy. But all that to say, I'm very addicted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm having a bad day, my first yeah, yeah. thought is never alcohol. It's never cigarettes. It's never drug. It's always, like, sugar. Yeah. I love a cookie. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I mean? yeah. And, like, uh, yeah, I'm the same, and I'm the part same of me way. wonders if yeah. that is just innate biology where I'm, like, I'm a human that wants calorie dense food and I don't really give a shit what it is as long as it's like sweet and f tastes good. Or is it, you know, I didn't really have a lot of sugar growing up and that repression. You know, apparently it doesn't work that way. Apparently if you're deprived of something growing up, it doesn't create an addict. What, what creates addictions is exposure to things when you're young, not, not, not being deprived of it. And, Interesting. And, uh, um, sugar is just, in, I, I mean, there's just a lot of evolutionary wiring that supports a taste for sugar. And, and I, I mean, that's just what you're fighting. Yeah. So you live this life where you sleep on the floor with your babies. You don't have an iPhone. You, it's like a very like, I don't want to call it holistic. It feels like reductive, but it is a very intentional way to live. But yet you live at least some of the year in New York City. Yeah, most of the year. They're in public school. so Which is like the antithesis of, you know, mindful, you know, right. human-centered living. So how do you square those those ideas i mean I, you know we we're gone a lot we, we you know we're in the i grew up going into the woods when i was young and and backpacking and stuff and we just we do a lot of that and uh um i i see new york as the human wilderness so instead of trees it's people and it's infinite and it's infinitely fascinating to me and i you know i live in a mixed income mixed race mixed everything neighborhood and uh it's extremely tight community and we, you know, people really know each other and look out for each other. And, you know, it feels extremely, extremely human in a kind of tribal sense. And uh, in a way that my, the sort of affluent suburb I grew up in outside of Boston did not feel human. It felt awful. So this feels good. It feels like the real sort of human, like good human, like fabric mm. in, in our lives there. And, and um, I, 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 abs I absolutely love it. That's interesting. I feel the same way. I really like New York. I really like, I grew up in Florida, kind of in a similar situation, just sort yeah. of a, a, you know, a suburb of Orlando. And moving to New York, I love being around people. I'm an energized by yeah. bumping into other humans. And the more strange and foreign to me they are, the better. Yeah. I really enjoy just meeting people with ideas that I've never even thought yeah. of. And it's like really energizing. And as a result, I love being here. I don't necessarily believe that you know the constant you know living in you know on these concrete streets and yeah you know in these tiny little boxes and breathing in you know fumes and things like that is good for me you know what i mean like if i was a if i was an alien looking at earth i'd be like there's no way like that's you know there's yeah. no way that's healthy but i guess with the other ways that you're living and kind of mitigating like social media and things like that i wonder if that creates a little bit more of a balance where you're present in the city but you're not overwhelmed by constant, you know, bombardment of negative news and things like that. You know, I long yeah. for this idea of like, oh, I'm going to get a ranch somewhere and just move away. Right. And, but I don't know if that's the solution. I mean, you, we're social primates and we need the proximity of others. What's weird about New York is the others are strangers, mm -hmm. right? It, as you walk around Midtown, where we live in the Lower East Side, you know, it's it's a um, intimate enough neighborhood that there's a, invariably when I go out, I'll see someone that I recognize. Mm -hmm. I'm not, we're not friends necessarily, but whatever. They're just a familiar face in the neighborhood and that's extremely human. And so I would, you know, part of that is, 
a function of income. I mean, the wealthier people are, the bigger walls they build, and the more separation there is between families. And in a in a poorer neighborhood, a uh, mixed income neighborhood like ours, people interact a lot because they need each other. And, I mean, there, when Hurricane Sandy, I don't know when you came here, but Hurricane Sandy hit about, uh, when was it, 2012, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the lights were, you know, there was no power in New York from 34th Street down. And um, it felt a little dicey, you know. And, and so in the neighborhood that I'm in, you know, there was, um, you know, there's some bad characters too, right? A lot, you know, it's, it's whatever. And, and uh, so the p local people that live there, and I live, I live in a predominantly Spanish-speaking building, and the people that live there, Dominican, Puerto Rican, and the people that live there were worried about the, the families that had children had to leave because they had no water, Right. So they left, which meant there were apartments that were empty, which meant that they could be burglarized. So the people that were stayed in the building figured out um, there was a woman there, extremely tough lady, a mom who uh, rustled up a machete. And so she figured out a sort of guard shift roster. And so she got all the teenage boys she knew, like young men that she knew. And they, they passed off the machete at the front door and they took turns guarding the front door with the machete. And and they also poured, poured sort of a urban trick. She, they, they poured cooking oil on the fire escapes. <laughs> and uh, because you can't, you can climb down a fire escape that's slick with cooking oil if you hold onto the railings, but you can't climb down with holding anything you've stolen. Uh... So uh, so they, they just slicked up the, the fire escapes with cooking oil and put a guard shift down there. Now that's community, right? I mean, those that, kids must have been thrilled. Oh, of course right, they were. When right. I was eighteen, if I'd been given a guard shift with a machete to protect a building of people that I cared about, like during the hurricane, oh my god! Like, and that went on for a week, and then finally the lights came back on, and the you know whatever. But that, you know that's the kind of experience that young men need. That's young men particularly. So interesting. Like the times I even reflect in my own life where I felt most connected to like my family and I had a big family was during hurricanes in Florida when all the power would go out yeah. and we would all kind of just be like stuck in the house. We all had to like clean up outside. We yeah. all had to, you know, cut down trees that, you know, were falling over in the street. Yeah. You know, play games and like play cards and stuff. It's yeah. those kind of moments that I that really stick out to me. Yeah, it's of course. wild, you know, 15, 20 years later that yeah. these things are so prevalent in my mind. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yep. and I think it's important to try to create those, even without crisis, for, right. for your own children. People, people in London miss the Blitz afterwards. Right, you soldiers know. in missing war. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, I looked at a hurricane in my book Tribe. I looked at a at, at a uh, sorry an earthquake that hit Italy, Avezzano, Italy, in nineteen you know twelve or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And and. Um, I think it was 94% of the population was killed, you know, within a minute. Like it was like, it was like they'd been hit by a nuclear bomb. Wow. And the survivors were on their own for days until like help could get to them. And this one guy who survived it said, he said the, <clears throat> during those days, no, none of the social distinctions mattered. Like rich, poor, good looking, not good looking, you know, criminal, not criminal, you know, whatever, nothing mattered. It was just how collaborative you were with the group, the survival group, and um, and he said the he said the earthquake, um, the earthquake the earthquake provided what the law promises but cannot in fact deliver, which is the equality of all men. And that broke down as soon as you know food and supplies and other people you know that broke down, but for a few days. Everything, everybody was equal. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very powerful position to be in. Like, right? Like, how exciting would that be? Yeah. But also tragic, where you're like, this is the worst thing ever. Yeah. But the egalitarian nature of the tragedy, yeah, that's a lot to think about. Yeah. That's powerful. Man, this, this is really, really interesting, the way that you've you've chosen to kind of like conduct your work and live your life. A another Thank question you. I'm curious, and you can skip on this if you want. I don't yeah. know if it's personal, but was there a reason that you waited later in life to have kids? Uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get, the first time I got married, I was 40, and I was just busy doing stuff. I'm sorry, I was 45. Uh, I was just busy doing stuff. And, um, and my wife couldn't have kids. It turned out we didn't know that, but she couldn't have kids, 
Uh, it was tragic for, for her, for us. It was really hard on the marriage, in some ways fatal to the marriage. Like it was, You always wanted kids. Yeah, I just didn't want to, I just wasn't in a hurry to have them because there was a lot of things I wanted to do, you know, and which is a luxury that men, you know, men have that women don't, unfortunately. And, um, but then boom, suddenly you're 50. I mean, life, I don't know how old you are, but you will, you will be, like, you're going to be 50, like, next weekend, basically. Like, it goes so fast. Yeah. So fast, right? And so, uh, my, you know, my wife and I, we, you know, we loved each other, and we had a wonderful relationship, but the not having children was, like, incredibly painful. And, you know, we just, you know, when you don't have children, it's not that you just don't have children. You have miscarriage after miscarriage. You're, you're, uh, your hopes, and then you're, they're dashed. I mean, it's absolutely brutal process, emotionally brutal process. Um. And uh, eventually, the, we're, we're still good friends, actually, thank God, we're, which is a lovely person. And uh, But then, you know, we broke up and, and I remarried and we did have kids. So I was, you know, I, I, my, I was a uh, father at um, 55. And I didn't, and it's the, you know, I just feel so lucky. Like, uh, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm glad it didn't happen at 25. It wouldn't have been the best thing that ever happened to me at 25. Hmm. Uh, sadly to say, it, I mean, to my... You know, like, uh, um, it doesn't say good things about me that that that's, that was true back then, right? But at fifty five, absolutely, and they're, they're the center of my my family, my wife and kids are just the center of everything for me. And I'm and I absolutely no, there's no competition between them and my career or something like this is zero. Like I just have not compared to them. I'm not interested in anything. And I work because I have to work, and you know whatever. I mean, I haven't, you know, but but they they are the center, the absolute center. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like you are so interested in tapping into like the deeply primal aspects of our nature, and having children, a family, is perhaps the most yeah. primal, right? It is like the some would argue like the entire purpose of our existence, right? It's like pass on your genes, that is success within the animal kingdom, yeah. and. It just, it, I don't know, it stuck out to me that you waited, I guess, obviously not necessarily your choice, um, for some time. And I'm curious, that purpose that you feel now, uh, you kind of mentioned it, but greater than any purpose you'd felt with career or anything prior to? Yeah, I mean, all that stuff is sort of drive and it's self-feeding, right? It sort of feeds itself as you do it because the intoxication of writing or whatever your thing is creates this sort of dynamic in you where it feeds itself and it propels you further. And it's a totally intoxicating experience. That's not quite what parenthood is, right? Sure. But there's, so, you know, there's something so primal and profound about parenthood. And they're just, the children are just like these little animals, right? I mean, they just like, they need you and they, you know, like they, they love you. And then sometimes they hate you and they, it's, just, it's all so visceral, right? And you know, amazing. And, and, um, so I, you know, sense of purpose, I mean, my purpose is to protect them. I mean, my purpose is to protect them and keep them safe and keep them happy and, 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 and turn them into good human beings. That's my purpose. And I have no other purpose. And do I do other things? Yeah, of course I do. But I have no other purpose. That's my purpose. Um, and to be a good citizen. Yeah, I would say also to be a good citizen of the country and of the world and of my neighborhood. I mean, that is radical, though, that you spent 55 years of your life with one purpose, and then just like that, your purpose entirely changed. Is, was that difficult? Was it painful? Well, I mean, you just, if you don't have children, you invent other purposes that that feel compelling. And so and when I was a journalist, my purpose was, I felt, I, you know, it was a little, sounds a little grandiose, I know, but it's, I was like, my, my purpose is to bring information to people so that, you know, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I, I had a whole construct in my head of the point of journalism, which I think is an enormously noble enterprise and and I don't think you can have a free society without it so you know it, it, it um, that was that generated an incredible sense of purpose and um, I you know I wouldn't have wanted parenthood to get in the way of that when I was young mm -hmm. right and then after a while um, you know once you have kids if it's a healthy if you're healthy and it's a healthy relationship, a healthy situation, you sort of realize like, maybe I wasn't ready for this 20 years ago, but what I'm doing right now eclipses everything I've ever done. Like it, it's, just, it's not even close. Yeah. Has your near death experience, did that also contribute to this perspective of, you know, your purpose in life? Or did, was that just a, uh, did it amplify it? <clears throat> I mean, what I learned, I'm, I was, you know, I'm very healthy. I'm an athlete. I, I don't, 
<clears throat> except for the occasional cigarette. I don't like, I, you know, like I'm, I'm not in any kind of risk category for anything. And <clears throat> I had a sort of an a, anomaly in my abdomen that was, um, would have almost certainly been fatal, except I got really lucky. Right. And so it made me realize like, damn, <clears throat> Life is sacred in its moments. And if you don't remind yourself of that occasionally, you're missing out. That's the problem with the smartphone. It keeps you out, takes you out of the sacred moment. And <clears throat> so much so that you never even really have them. And I'm, I'm not saying you should live in a state of sort of like Buddhist bliss all the time. Of course not, right? But to just to understand all, you know, you don't have the past anymore because it's past. You have no idea if you're going to have any future at all. I woke up that morning just expecting that I would live to the end of the day, right? Like, why wouldn't I? And I almost didn't. It was an utterly ordinary day. And in the middle of a sentence to my wife, I felt a pain in my abdomen. I was like, damn, what's that? That's weird. And within a couple of minutes, I couldn't stand up because I was bleeding so hard into my abdomen. And I was dying in the middle of a sentence, right? And so what I realized was, damn, this is all you get is right now. Right. And the, 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 the value of the, the, the moment of the present moment is infinite only because the moment's finite. It's the finiteness of the moment that makes its value just sort of infinite. And when you really understand that you're really living. That is so interesting. Yeah. We, we put <clears throat> so much value on, on rarity and scarcity, things that are, you know, ephemeral that will never yeah. That, that there's only a few of and the present moment yeah. is the most rare thing yeah that could ever happen yeah and right there's an avalanche of them but you never know when the avalanche is going to stop and it's it's a, it's fleet you know it's like just this moment now and now and now and that's it that's all you'll ever get and you know that 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 doesn't preclude ambition, right? The present moment might include you writing the great American novel. I mean, it doesn't. It, it's no comment on what you should be doing with your present moment, but just the understanding that that is that is the sacred thing of existence is right now, and it, things that take you out of right now into something that is, is essentially repetitive and meaningless. That's a waste of life. And why did the experience make you more? It it, it seems like it didn't make you fearful. Oh, it made me very fear fearful. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. I spent a year as a, like, par a hypochondriac agoraphobic. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I got super neurotic. <laughs> like, I, I was a miserable time. I finally got climbed out of it. I, you know, I just kept thinking, my God, this could happen again. There's a lot of arteries in your body. And, you know, uh, uh, if maybe I have another aneurysm and it could rupture at any time. And I got to make sure I can get to a hospital within 90 oh, wow. minutes. I didn't realize but, it was a year. Yeah. I was, I was. I was pretty crazy for a while. I just, it was super, super. I just had an anxiety disorder. I mean, I, I had a kind of trauma. And also, I, um, I when I was dying, um, I got to the ER. In the, it took an hour and a half to get to the ER. I was on Cape Cod. We have a property in, in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. It was very far from the hospital. And I finally got there. And I got there, you know, the doctor estimated about 10 minutes before cardiac arrest. I, mean, I was right at the right at the end, right? And... Uh, my body was going off a cliff and, um, and they were, you know, I was conscious. I was talking to the doctors, but I was super messed up and they were putting a large gauge needle into my jugular, cordis line in my jugular to transfuse me, right? So they drop a needle through your throat, like th into your, into your neck, into your jugular and start pumping blood into you. And so he was doing that, right? And I'm lying there and he's doing that. And all of a sudden, this. So I'm an atheist, right? I don't, I'm not a spiritualist. I'm not a mystic. I'm certainly not Christian. I'm like, I'm a rationalist. I don't believe in anything. And I don't even want to believe in anything, right? But as I lay there, this big black pit opened up underneath me. And I felt myself getting pulled into it. And I was, and I had no idea I was dying, right? But I didn't want to go into the pit because I knew if I went into the pit, I was never coming out. Like, that much I knew. And I, I wasn't thinking about my family. I was like a gut shot coyote, right? I, mean, I was like an animal. I was like, do not go into the pit. It was terrifying. I was getting pulled into it. I was like, fuck, here we go. And um, that was me dying, right? And, um, and as that was happening, my dead father appeared above me. 
and above me and to my left in this sort of energy form. It's very hard to describe. It wasn't like a photograph of him. It was like his essence was there. But I could see him, right? He was there. He appeared above me. And just sort of wel he was sort of welcoming me. He was like, it's okay. Don't fight it. You can come with me. You're going to be okay. He didn't say that, but that was, that was his communication, right? And I was like, what are you doing here? Like, I didn't know I was dying. I was like, dad, like, go with you? You're dead. I'm not going with you. Like, are you kidding? I was horrified by it. And I turned to the doctor who was working on my neck and I said, you're going to hurry. You're losing me right now. I'm going. Right. So I remembered that when I woke up in the ICU the next morning, I remembered that. It all came back to me. I was like, shit, my dad was there. What? What was he doing? Like, and then I started to look into it. And it turns out what the experience I had was very common. And what people, they're called near-death experiences. And they're, they're really quite mysterious, like why they happen and what does it... Some people say it's just neurology, it's neurochemicals during a, you know, a dying brain produces, you know, they have seizures and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. You know, but, you know, of course, other people say, aha, proof of an afterlife. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Like, right. But I'm writing a book called Pulse about what happened and what it might possibly mean. But that was, it wasn't pleasant. It was terrifying. It was uh, confusing. And it destabilized me psychologically. And I'm a pretty solid guy psychologically, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm not a depressive. I don't, whatever, I'm fine. Um, it destabilized me psychologically in a way that combat never even touched. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Because I know you had PTSD after combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nothing compared to this. This was absolutely really? devastating, yeah. Yeah. I just thought I could die at any moment. I was like, damn. Every morning, I was like, get ready to die because it could happen. And that's a really neurotic way to live. But it actually is an enlightened way to live because it's true. You could die at any moment. You, 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 anyone could die any day. Right. Yeah, the awareness isn't necessarily the problem. It was what you were doing with the awareness. That's right. That's right. right. The awareness should make you say, wow, I'm so grateful for this exact moment. Let's try to make the most of this present exactly. moment. Whereas you were saying, I better not do anything or else it's going to all go away. Right. Like the, right. Yeah. It was complicated. And I finally climbed out of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I actually got help. Like I, had, I talked to somebody because I, really, um, I, was, I was really struggling. In a mm -hmm. way that I never didn't think I w w w was capable of struggling. Like, I really surprised my, I didn't recognize myself psychologically. I was like, damn, that fell apart fast. <laughs> Is that scary, being on the brink of, like, sanity? Yeah, like, it's, of course, it's terrifying, yeah. Like, did you think, oh, this is going to be forever? This is going to be the rest of my life? Well, that's, that's what trauma feels like, right? It's like, oh, this is forever. And it's not. And people do recover, and I did, you know, whatever. But it, And it's a really well-known thing, like, sort of medical trauma, like... PTSD from near death experience. You know, it's 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 really really common, and but I didn't know that, and I just was turned into a super super neurotic person. Mm -hmm. And I'm not neurotic, right? Like I'm very laid back. I'm the one thing that's, I'm not as neurotic. And boom, I was the most neurotic guy you ever knew. Yeah, it was very funny. Yeah, that's. I mean, it sounds like an awful way to be living. Now, in reflection, are you sort of charmed by the idea that your dad was there? Like, does that give you peace? Does that make you feel comforted? Does that scare you more? Like, what is your general it feeling? It just completely that? unnerved me. Like, and I, I, it wasn't comforting. I mean, maybe it's a low, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's, that, that, that would take another three hours to answer adequately. <laughs> but uh, I didn't extract a lot of comfort from it. The whole thing was so, um, so terrifying. And I, it would have been less terrifying if I didn't have children. But you mm -hmm. can feel such a sense of responsibility. I'm like, oh, my God, my daughters were almost left without a father. Like, that just seemed like such such a violation or such, oh, I don't know, I transgression. Like, I, I, like I, 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 I had a very hard time thinking about that possibility. The first thing I thought when I woke up in the ICU and the nurse came in, she was like, hey, Mr. Young, I was in Massachusetts, it was a pretty strong Boston accent going on. I was like, hey, Mr. Young, congratulations. You know, like you survived. Like no one thought you were going to make it. I was like, what? I just went into the hospital with a bellyache. Like, what are you talking about? So oh, you almost died yesterday. No one thought you'd make it. You didn't realize that. No, I had no idea. Until what? Wow. The next, this morning. No idea. 
I mean, I knew something messed up was going on, but, I, but I didn't know. I, I had no idea that I was di basically dying, and they pulled me back. No idea. I was shocked. I was totally shocked. And then I just thought about my family, my wife and my daughter. I was like, oh, my God. And uh, then she came back an hour later on her rounds to say, how you doing? You know, how you doing? And I was like, well, uh, I'm okay, except what you said really upset me. Like, it was really scary. Yeah, bedside manner is not really You're the right. best in but Massachusetts. Then, but then she said, um, try thinking, try this. Instead of thinking about it like something scary, think about it like something sacred. I was like, all right. That I can get behind. And I've been thinking about it ever since. Has it encouraged you to look into spiritualism at all? No. I, 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 spirit, I mean, I want to I wanna understand how the universe works, not how to make my so I feel better about it, mm -hmm. which I think is what religion is. Right. Totally understandable, but I just, I'm not, I'm not interested. Like, I see. But if you have this profound, like sacred experience, that the energy of your father is either there yeah. in your mind or in reality, who's to say? For me, I guess it would, it would make me curious to look into potentially what was happening if there was some other type of, you know, plane you were entering well, that, into. Yeah, I mean, there's some theories that involve quantum physics and conscious, the nature of consciousness and stuff like that that attempt to explain some of that because it's a really common thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking into that. I see. Yeah, and that's part of what my book is about. Right. But I'm not looking into religion, right? I, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I guess I wouldn't characterize it specifically as religion, but this idea that, you know, is there this collective consciousness that we're all a part of yeah. that... You know, once we get off of this present reality, we enter into some other place or some some yeah. other version of consciousness. It's, what I realize is like the possibility that there's quote life after death is like incredibly small, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't it's not consistent with anything we know about the nature of matter and time and the universe, right? So the chances of that being true are incredibly small. But the chances of there being a universe in the first place were incredibly small. Right. Right? I mean, the parameter, the physical parameters for the force of gravity and, you know, the weight of carbon, and I don't, I'm not a physicist, you know, what, all that stuff. Apparently, it, the, the odds are like negative 10 to the 200th power or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right? So is life after death unlikely? Yeah. Life before death is just as unlikely. The whole fucking thing's unlikely, right? So when you're talking, when you're mucking around with those kinds of odds, already just to explain that we're here in the first place, it's not inconceivable that there's something we don't understand that happens after the, our physical death. It's totally possible. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of the way I see it. I'm, I I I kind of almost look at it like a Pascalian way, where I'm like. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but there's a lot of upside if there is. So, you know, operating under some type of like, you know, spiritual parameter. It doesn't have to be specifically within some type of dogmatic religion. Do this, don't right. do this, talk to this guy, not this guy. But just a general belief like, oh, there is some type of higher power that wants me to be happy and it wants good things for me, but also wants me to do good. Right. And that is sort of the exchange. I don't think that's yeah. out of the question. I mean, that's a great way of getting yourself to do good in the world, right? I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, the, 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 the answers that the quantum physicists are working on around all this stuff doesn't, it, it's completely outside of the moral conversation about how you lead your life, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, 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 I mean, it, it has to do with the nature of matter and the nature of con uh, of consciousness and things that we just don't really understand. And if, if there is a post mortem. Ex survival of the individual in any, on any level, on any plane, any dimension, in any way, that's true whether you lead a good life or not, right? I mean, it's just like, like either we turn into either our, our, um, our bodies when we die, either they fall apart and we no longer exist, right? We, we rot, we're, we're incinerated and you know, turned to ashes and buried by our grieving family. And we either survive or we don't, but that's not, um, that's not going to be dependent on how we act. Mm. Any more sense. so than it would for an elephant or a chimpanzee or whatever. Interesting. Well, Sebastian, this has been amazing. I've, uh, I've taken up enough of your time, I think. 
Um, it's a pleasure talking to you. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. It really has like changed my perspective on a lot of things. And Thank you. Uh, I'm really grateful that you would take the time to spend these uh, these moments to be present with me. I, so. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And you know, when my book Pulse comes out, you know, if you want to talk again, I would like, love that. I'll have a lot yeah, to yeah, say. I would love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to get into all of it, and then we can yeah. we can argue about the uh, the existence of an afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. I appreciate it.